us this morning. Um, just a reminder for everyone that this is being live streamed. Um, it's being distributed through YouTube and also through the audio channel. Keep in mind, you know, if you're going through a noisy area, please keep your uh, Zoom on mute. Also for our presenters, for the way that it streams through YouTube, if you could keep your um, sound off and your video off until you present, it makes it easier for people who are watching on YouTube for the amount of squares that they're able to look at. Um, with that, I think we're gonna jump straight into introductions and then over to our presenters. Um, up first, I'm Senator Maddie Daughtry. I'm the Senator of this commission. I represent Senate District 24, which are the communities of Brunswick, Harpswell, North Yarmouth, Freeport, and Pownall. Unfortunately, my house co-chair could not make it today due to prior work and family commitments, which fits right in with the theme of today. Um, but she sends her, um, her regards and will be catching up by watching the recording. So with that, um, I'll kick it over to introduce Senator Rosen. Thank you, Senator Daughtry. Um, I'm Senator Kimberly Rosen, Senate District 8. My district goes from Castine. I have 16 towns in Hancock County and Penobscot County, including the city of Brewer, and I live in Bucksport. Thank you. Thank you. And Representative Stearns? Good morning. My name is Paul Stearns. I live in Guilford. I'm the House Representative for District 119, which is in Piscataquis County. And then I'm just gonna go around how they show up in my Zoom screen. So apologies if it doesn't line up with yours. Um, Charlie Mitchell, if you'll start. Oh, you're on mute. Hi, I'm Charlie Mitchell. I live in Gray and I own uh, Bayside Bowl in Portland, Maine. Thank you, Charlie. And Sarah Bryden. Good morning, my name is Sarah Bryden. I am, uh, my role um, on the commission is to serve as a, um, a an expert on the industry. Um, I've been doing leave of absence compliance work for more than 10 years. Um, so FMLA and starting to get into um, more and more of the states that are doing um, paid leave in, in other parts of the country. So that's that's me. Thank you, Andrew Christopher. Hey everyone, um, my name is uh, Drew Christopher Joy. Uh, I work at the Southern Maine Worker Center and I'm here as an uh, expert on worker and self-employed uh, people's issues. And um, I just want to apologize. I'm not at home and my the internet where I'm at is not great. Um, and there's also a loud noise. So um, I'm probably going to keep my camera off a lot of the time just to be able to um, stay connected. Thanks, everyone. Completely understood. No worries at all. And Commissioner Fortman? I am Laura Fortman. I'm the Commissioner of the Maine Department of Labor, and I'm here to offer whatever technical assistance I can. Thank you, Commissioner. And Wendy Estabrook? Good morning, I'm Wendy Estabrook. I'm a director of human resources for LL Bean. And Barbara Crowley. Good morning, I'm Barbara Crowley, a retired pediatrician and I work now at Maine General um, on an endowment. I'm here to represent um, children and mothers. Thank you, and then Emily Ingerson. Hi, I'm Emily Ingerson. I own Ginger Hill Design and Build and I'm a small business representative. Thank you, Emily. And then Bonita, are you able to unmute and introduce yourself? Potentially. If she's unable, I'll do a quick introduction for her. We also have Bonita Usher joining us as one of the commission members as well. And Bonita, if you are able to unmute, just um, jump right in. So with that, we have um, another morning of presentations. Really grateful to folks are going to be able to join us. And I think just in the interest of time, I'm going to jump right in. Um, up first, we have a presentation on the main paid leave coalition proposal. Um, we have Dusty Hoffman Sprague, who is joining us as the coalition chair, and she's also being joined by James Mayall from MESEP, who's also been working with them as the coalition. After that, um, we will be having a presentation from the main chamber and U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and then we'll additionally be having another national perspective with the presentation of the fundamentals of paid leave programs from the National Conference of State Legislatures. But with that, um, I think, Dusty, if you're ready to kick it off, I will pass it right over to you. Hello, um, I think I'm ready. Thank you so much um, for inviting the coalition. Um, I'm just delighted to be here and I really have to thank you for your excellent work so far. It's been exciting to watch. Um, so thank you all for being here and committing the level of like time and energy 
um, that you're putting into this work. So we appreciate you. I am Desi Holman Sprague. I'm the executive director of the Maine Women's Lobby. The Maine Women's Lobby has been working on gender equitable and gender just legislative advocacy since 1978. And we have been working on paid family and medical leave for almost the entire duration of that 43 years. We were um, at the lead of implementing Maine's um, unpaid family and medical leave program in the late 80s. We were out ahead of almost every other state and the federal government. Um, so we are delighted to still be um, doing this work, leading this work, and are the leaders of the Maine Paid Leave Coalition. So we shared a couple of weeks ago or a week or two ago um, a presentation about our coalition as well as um, our core coalition's values and what we really hope to see in a comprehensive universal program. So I'm going to go through a lot of what you've already seen, but hopefully with more pictures, um, an opportunity for questions. I can't promise to be as funny and engaging as the Colorado guy. Sorry about that. Um, he was really an ace presenter, so um, I'll do my best. I'm going to share um, my screen here um, and go through slides. So there we are. Everybody can see that? Perfect. Great. Um, so um, about the coalition. We are a group of um, partners working together to create comprehensive leave. Uh, there are many of us. We have a significant partner list. This is a lot of words for one page, um, one slide, and that is because there are 27 member organizations, as well as a number of small businesses who support this issue. You'll see that it spans everything from folks who work on interpersonal violence to um, organizations representing kids, representing families, representing employers, working um, on issues of aging, uh, caregiving. And that is really because absolutely everybody in Maine is um, potentially stands to benefit from the creation of a program. So together, uh, these organizations represent hundreds of thousands of Mainers. Um, we know also that we are not alone as a coalition in supporting the issue. 75% um, of Mainers uh, support the creation of a paid family and medical leave program. This is from a statewide survey done through the Pan-Atlantic um, Omnibus Survey, which I think most folks know they're the only survey outfit in Maine that is um, ranked by 537, the political, nonpartisan political survey firm. So we know that three quarters of Mainers support the creation of a system. We know that that spans every political affiliation. And we also know that it spans geography. In fact, folks in CD2 support um, paid leave even more highly than folks in CD1. So um, we're a broad coalition and we're, uh, that is part of why we bring to you proposals that span a lot of different um, issue areas and values. I'll talk um, briefly about our coalition values and principles. These are values that we all as a coalition have come together and um, wanted to want to make sure is at the forefront of our thinking about a paid family leave system. Because we represent so many needs, it gives us an opportunity to really think about what is comprehensive and what serves every population. You know, if we were really primarily just representing elder care folks, we might only be thinking about issues related to that. Because we have such broad representation, our values are quite wide um, and broad. So we, um, we believe that policy should be universal and that all workers should have an opportunity to participate. And uh, we see in other states that when there are carve-outs or complications to the program, it actually potentially makes it more expensive or less sustainable. If everybody pays in and everybody benefits, the program is more likely to be successful in the long term. Um, and I've included here a few links to 
folks who are storytellers within our network, just to kind of put a few human face on the words. So you'll see here, um, this is Stephen, a veteran who, and, and we don't often think of veterans as part of paid family and medical leave. And so Stephen, um, you know, really thinks that, uh, that veterans need to be participated. And so that's what we think of when we think about universal. Um, we think that programs need to be gender inclusive and gender responsive um, and not relying on sort of traditional categories of families, wives, husbands, et cetera. Um, and so we know we've heard from Dana, whose uh, family is made up of same sex partners. And so that gender responsiveness is really important to them. Programs should include job protection. Um, workers won't take leave, even if they're entitled to leave, if they don't know that they can come back to the job that they've left behind. So this is really a critical piece of any kind of plan. And we've heard from Andrea, who uh, had access to leave, but it was not job protected leave. So she actually wasn't able to come back into her role, even though she was paid after she experienced a stroke in her 30s. Obviously, nobody expects that kind of health um, experience in their 30s, and we can't plan for it. She ended up having to go back to work despite her doctor's orders because she didn't have that job protection. Plans should include all kinds of families. You all talked last week, and we really appreciated hearing from you about your commitment to ensuring that a lot of different family types are included. We know that Maine has um, families that run the gamut and that we need to have a comprehensive definition to make sure everyone is included and that it really reflects the reality of Maine. So here's a story from Katrina, who's a foster parent. Um, in some areas where we see programs that don't really include foster parents, for example. And so that's not taking into account um, the, the expansive experience of what family is. Programs should be comprehensive. That means addressing or including um, bonding and caring for young children, caring for a sick family member, either a spouse or an aging parent or a child, um, and also one's own medical condition, actually about 70%. We often think about the baby aspect, but about 70% of people accessing paid family leave are doing so uh, to attend to their own health following you know, major surgery or a medical event like Andrea's stroke that I mentioned a couple of minutes ago. So making sure that we cover all of those areas as well as the possibility of military employment um, brings, brings everybody into the program and keeps everybody at the table. Here's an example from Tom, whose wife had early onset Alzheimer's. So the kind of caregiving that Tom had to be able to provide um, you know, was essential to be included in the program. Tom ended up having to leave his job because of the level of care that his wife required. And so we need to, to keep into account the many kinds of caregiving as well as you know, babies, personal recovery. We believe that programming should be a social insurance program. We know that we can achieve more cost efficiencies and have more benefit portability, which is something that you all also talked about last week. Um, it's also more predictable when we have a universal program that is a social insurance where everybody's chipping in and everybody has an opportunity to access it. This is uh, the kind of program that exists in every other developed country in the world with the exception of Pow Pow New Guinea. Here's a story from Fran who had to shop around to multiple different employers over many, kind, uh, many years because of the kind of care that she knew she was going to need to be able to provide to her family. And so a social insurance program would eliminate this kind of employer shopping and then employee turnover. 
Programs should include adequate wage replacement. That means that people need to be able to continue to pay their bills and support their families while they're on leave. When wage replacement is not adequate, even when they're eligible, low wage workers won't take that leave. We really think that uh, workers who have the least amount of income need to have the most amount of wage replacement so that we can ensure that those folks are also uh, meaningfully able to participate in the program without putting their families' economic security at risk. Here's a story from Harley who uh, did not have access to paid leave and had to go back after seven weeks because she could not afford to continue to stay home. When she did so, she had almost no paid time off remaining in the event that her baby had any kind of health concern or that she had a health need following the recovery of her birth. The program should be long enough it takes time to recover from your own surgery. It takes time to bond with the child. It takes time to sit with a dying parent. We need to make sure that we really have a program that is enough time. And most states have something in the range of 12 to 24 weeks. Um, that's a time that, you know, something like paid sick time is just simply inadequate for what we're talking about here. And that is why paid sick time or the current paid time off bill, while we love it and support it, is not getting to the heart of what we need when we talk about a paid family and medical leave program. Here is a story from Dale who knew that in order to recover from her knee surgery, she needed at least 10 weeks away from work. So 10 days is not going to get Dale to where she needs to be in order to be healthy and be able to return to the workforce. Programs should be paid for by both workers and employers. Seven out of 10 states have this kind of cost sharing. And by ensuring that costs are shared, everybody shares the benefits and everybody shares the commitments. It also makes sure that the costs are significantly lowered so that it um, is not such a, a bite into any individual or any employer's um, costs. Here's a story from Lindsay who did have access to paid leave and it ensured that after she had a major health situation, she was able to continue to stay with her employer. So we know that the employer continued to benefit from having her ongoing employment and not having to pursue hiring, turnover, turnover costs, et cetera. So it really is a benefit to the employer to be able to keep those folks on board in um, in the organization or in the company. We also know that programs need to include outreach, uh, that the folks who most need the program are the least likely to use it. Uh, Low-income workers, workers of color, workers without a college degree, um, if they don't know about the program. I think you've heard in several places so far um, just how critically important it is to include outreach and education as you launch a program like this. And we really wanna make sure that that's at the center of any kind of program in Maine. And we wanna make sure that any federal proposal um, ensures that states can still move forward. Folks know that there's a, a proposal on the table right now in Washington, DC for paid family and medical leave. But this is a great example of why we want to make sure that state and local programs can work together. What they're talking about at the federal level is four weeks. And we know from Dale's knee surgery story that four weeks is not going to do it. She was looking at 10 weeks as a baseline. And um, you know, many kinds of care require much twice that time. So four weeks is just the beginning. We want to be sure that the state has an opportunity to build on top of that so that we can really meet all of the needs. So um, that is, those are our coalition values. Um, I want to next move into talking about 
into talking about um, the specific policy proposals that we agree on as a coalition. But first, I'm going to turn the, the mic over to James from Maine Center for Economic Policy, because James's modeling is really what helped us get there as a coalition to understand what specifically we were talking about in the same way you all are looking for um, numbers from your actuarial study to help you um, really realize what it will look like in, um, in the practical reality. So, James, thanks so much for your support and take it away. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Dusty, and um, thank you to everyone on the commission for having me talk. I will um, share my screen um, just to continue the presentation and show you, um, walk you through. I don't have um, a huge amount to go through, but I'll just give you a little sense of kind of um, what we did in terms of the math side to try and get to um, uh, to try and get to uh, the kind of cost estimate of the program, um, that sort of thing. So um, the, the, I, I, I worked with the coalition to try and look at sort of what it might look like to have, um, to figure out how much it's gonna cost to put in a paid family medical leave program. Um, the primary source for that is looking at information from, based on uh, publicly available Census Bureau data, which looks at kind of how much the key factors are, so some of the demographics of the state, so we know who's gonna be taking leave and why, um, looking at the how much people are earning, so we know how much revenue or what the revenue base is, and so how much the tax rate would need to be to raise the amount of money we need, um, and um, and then also looking at um, some other factors like the kind of occupations people have, how many people are self-employed, that sort of thing. Um, the the basis of a lot of the modeling comes from um, a, a software simulation called the Workers Plus model. Uh, that the U.S. Department of Labor has shared. Um, that's I think developed by um, some economists at um, different institutions. Um, the calculations that we did there are you know one of the things we really need to know is um, how much people are going to use the program. Um, so where we you know it's one thing to figure out how many people may be eligible for the program. Um, the results come out at about five hundred and fifty thousand Mainers would be eligible for the program. Um, but we need to know how many people are going to use it each year and how, how what purposes are we going to use it for. Um, and in general, um, the number of people who use it is um, in the range of about 55,000 people using it each year. Um, obviously, not all of them are taking the maximum amount of leave. It depends on sort of their needs and that sort of thing. Um, that, that version of about 55,000 people taking it each year um, is based on the experience of Rhode Island, which is uh, of the three sort of long-standing states that have programs in place for a long time, uh, Rhode Island, California, and New Jersey. Rhode Island is the program that has the high, highest rates of use. Um, so um, by using the Rhode Island estimates, that gives that errs us on the side of, uh, erring on the side of uh, more use. And so hopefully the, the final cost may well be lower than that. Um, but it felt important to sort of go for the highest use range um, and then be pleasantly surprised when, when things are lower rather than the other way around. Um, and so a lot of the modeling we did um, assumed having a, a wage replacement rate of up to 90% for the lowest paid workers. Um, Desti, I know, is going to go through some of the assumptions and or some of the recommendations for uh, the coalition's recommended policy, and that's sort of one of the ones in there. Um, so in terms of sort of what that means, all those different assumptions mean in terms of what the cost could be, um, the, uh, the cost for the programs, it could really depend on sort of what sort of program we want to implement. Um, it's a little bit like um, purchasing a new car. Um, there are um, a series of different base models you can look at. Um, and those are primarily kind of, if you're looking at a program that is 12 weeks or 20 weeks uh, or 24 or anything in between those, um, that's kind of the basic amount of cost you're looking at. That's the biggest factor. Um, but then there are a bunch of different inputs that you might want to put on. Um, so some of those add-ons might include um, making sure that people have access to safe leave. Um, it could include exemptions for um, the employer side of the payroll tax for smaller, the smallest businesses. Um, it could in include um, access to leave for people who have been unemployed for a short period of time. So there are a series of different things you can add on to sort of customize the policy 
and those all generally increase the cost by little amounts on top of that, that fundamental decision of how many weeks you're going to have. Um, so sort of based on the um, based on, on the, the, the model and sort of the proposals that we're looking at, um, the, the proposal that Desti is going to run you through in a minute um, is towards the lower end of this range. Um, it would look something like between um, 0.55% payroll tax and a 0.75% payroll tax. So be, uh, roughly between half a percentage, half a percent of your weekly paycheck and three quarters of 1%. Um, so if you're a worker, an average worker in the middle of the wage range in Maine, um, you're earning a weekly wage, wage of approximately $1,000 a week. And that means that every week you're contributing somewhere between a $5.50 and $7.50 um, to the program. And that's the total cost. So if you have a program that's split between employers and employees, the worker is contributing something between about $2.75 and $3.75 a week. Um, and the employer is contributing the same amount. So you can think of it in terms of the cost is somewhere in the range of um, a cup of coffee a week um, or um, something, something like that. So you've got a reasonably modest cost per week um, to fund the program. And that's partly because um, it, that's partly dependent on having um, everybody paying into the program uh, really allows that cost to be spread out over a large period of time. Um, so those are sort of the fundamentals in terms of how much it's gonna cost. I'm certainly happy also to walk through with the, with the commission um, in more detail that, and I, I will send over a written version of the proposal that has some of that laid out in more detail as well. Um, that's sort of my piece and I'm happy to hand back over to you, Destiny. Okay, thanks so much, James. Um, and I will say, you know, from our perspective, as we were going through with our, our policy subcommittee, that having that kind of information at hand and being able to see those numbers, like if it's 16 weeks, then here's what the base cost is. If we add on 20, here's what the cost is. was really helpful for us to be able to make good decisions about, um, about how we wanted to move forward as a coalition. So <clears throat> I will move forward. Thanks for that. Okay. So we have, I think, five different specific proposals. First is the length and nature of the leave. So as I said, when I went through the values, those are our general collective values. Um, every member of the coalition signs onto those when they join the coalition. But we wanted to move forward with much more specific um, proposals for your policy framework, and that's what we have here. So for the length and nature of the leave, we're recommending one bucket of leave for all standard leave purposes with a total cap of 20 weeks. Some states have a certain amount of leave for um, recovery and bonding for a new baby, a different amount for family caregiving, a different amount for personal recovery, then you get into you know, complications when we talk about different kinds of recovery, like how many weeks does surgery merit versus something else. We really think that this kind of um, overall bucket um, simplifies the program, makes it make more sense for everyone, makes it easier to administer uh, because there are not so many different pieces happening, uh, easier to communicate about, and make sure that it's more um, equitable in terms of the different kinds of populations who need to access the leave. So we think that that, that bucket, you know, it's the kind of thing that worked for our coalition because our coalition recognizes the many different kinds of need for leave. And that was something that we could really be unified around. And we think that that suggestion is a great place for you all to consider your, um, your work. There are other states that do this. Um, Massachusetts, for example, they have two different kinds of um, like a medical leave or other kinds of leave, but that unified bucket um, does exist elsewhere. Um, and, uh, and there are several different examples. And then in terms of that 20 week, if it sounds like a lot, I'll just point out that um, in temporary disability insurance states like California, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, 
um, they're looking at maximum duration of leave between 26 and 52 state, uh, 52 weeks. So 20 weeks is really just getting us started. It's a baseline um, in our opinion. And we also know that states that have implemented their programs more recently uh, tend to have longer periods of leave. So that means states who were beginning the work when they were kind of going out on a limb and nobody knew what it would look like, they were implementing lower levels of leave or shorter durations of leave because they didn't know how it would work. We know now that it works to offer 16, 20, 24 weeks of leave. And so as states come online with their programs, they're offering those longer duration because we know it's possible. The next area is wage replacement and cap, um, how much a person would receive. We think that aligning the income replacement with the unemployment insurance standard is what we would suggest as a coalition. This is because, um, well, let's see, this, I'll, I'll say, um, here's what that would look like. Um, I've included the math here for you, and I will share this PowerPoint for it with you if you'd like to see it. Um, but the example, when we connect it with um, the unemployment insurance, I kind of walk through here. Like if you, the, the $1,000 a week average weekly wage, um, you'd get <laughs> uh, half of, ha wages of half, that $500 a week would be matched at 90%. Wages at more than half of the average weekly wage would be a 50% wage replacement. So at the bottom, short story, if you earned $750 a week, you'd have a replacement of about $600 per week. Um, I am confident that Commissioner Fortman, um, who's listening, who I'm sure is very familiar with the Unemployment insurance replacement is cringing at whatever I just described um, and can speak to you with a lot more expertise about it. I think the short story for us is that we want to make the program as simple as possible. And so aligning with the UI standard gives us more clarity. It's something people already understand how to use, how to administer, how to access it. And anywhere that we can offer clarity and simplicity um, or align with what already exists, I think makes it easier for users and administrators. The next recommendation we have is around the payroll tax cap. What that means is, um, does everyone chip in at, every, at a percentage of every portion of their earnings? Some systems like Social Security only have a payroll tax up to a certain percent of your income or up to a total dollar amount of your income. We recommend that there should not be a cap on payroll taxes, that all um, payroll taxes should be subject to a paid leave uh, payroll tax. And this is really because we wanna make sure that folks of all income levels chip into the system um, so that the overall payroll tax is very low. This is not um, unheard of to go ahead and tax every portion of the income. Uh, Washington, D.C. has no payroll tax cap, and that means they have a really um, high-end program that is only a rate of 0.62. So if you remember back from James's comments about what that rate means, that translates into about $6.20 per week per employee um, on the average weekly wage, $1,000 per week. Um, if you cap that, you obviously have to collect more from everyone in order to, to meet the full need. The next piece is around the employer and employee contribution. So who's paying for the program? We suggest that both employers and employees chip in 50% to the overall program, but that small businesses be exempt from the employer side commitment. We think that sharing um, the costs in the same way uh, folks at every income bracket should be chipping in. Um, we think that sharing the costs keeps the costs low for everyone. 
seven out of 10 states agree and use this system. Um, we do recognize that we don't want to place that added burden on small businesses. And so exempting them makes sure that they're really meaningfully able to participate in the program. Um, we also think that it's really important to note that this is not just a support for employees. I've been highlighting stories of workers, but that employers really thrive when they're able to offer paid leave. Um, they're able to hire and retain staff, um, and the benefits outweigh the costs, and they're able to participate in this kind of program. And so having them chip in um, to receive those benefits only seems normal and natural to us. We know um, that it's really paid off in other states. So in over 10 years of administering the program in California, um, the vast majority, nine out of 10 businesses, report no increased costs to their organization despite chipping in 50% of the payroll tax. Um, and in fact, one in 10 businesses report reduced costs from turnover savings when they implemented their program. We also see that um, employers thrive because they um, have increased productivity when workers aren't trying to balance those home needs, personal needs, recovery needs with their employment. So businesses really do better when they're able to offer this benefit. Um, in fact, I have a graph here from um, business impacts of paid leave study that was done in 2019 showing that in states that offer paid leave, you can really see that on the purple side, um, after paid leave is implemented, um, profits actually are increasing for most companies. Um, I think that's it on the employer, but yes, everybody benefits, everybody chips in. Finally, I wanna just briefly touch on the family definition. Um, this was not in the packet that we sent you because it was not quite ready yet, but I wanted to um, share with you that we recommend, um, and, and I will share this in writing, using broad language, which includes um, family that is, covers uh, strong personal bonds, not just biological family um, or legal family. And then making sure that the definition of family links to the Maine Parentage Act and existing language for domestic partners as the basis for your statutory language or framework. Um, this was proposed by our partners at GLAD um, and the LGBTQ Policy Committee um, because A, it's inclusive of the many kinds of families in Maine, as you all discussed last week, but also by connecting to those existing laws in Maine, it ensures that that language that's been really carefully crafted by lots of stakeholders um, is used and you know, brought into um, a policy framework and that anytime updates are made to that language, um, it automatically would update in um, the paid leave uh, schema. So a lot of information in not a lot of time. Um, but I'm happy to entertain your questions and uh, James is still on with me. So if you have questions about the math, I'm sure he's happy to jump in as well. Thank you so much, Dusty and James for your presentation. Do I have any questions from the commission? Barbara. Hi, thanks to both of you. Um, this might be more for James, but uh, Dusty may have a, um, when you, when you did your modeling um, around costs and costs for employers, and, and Desti, you had some information about the fact that there was an increased um, value per FTE. Have, has there been any modeling about what the effect is of having a worker out for different periods of time? You know, obviously the person did some work, so the, the employer is going to have to fill in that work. And does the model include that? Um, the figures that I gave do not include that. There is some um, information I can, I can get you and I'd be happy to share with the commission on that. I mean, I think the, what some folks are able to find is that, I mean, the advantage of sort of 
the advantage of workers and employers paying into the system sort of in advance in those small amounts is that they're then not playing the employer's, you know, the employee salary while they're out, um, which makes it a little easier to fill that in. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, but so there are some trade-offs in terms of, um, you know, having to hire somebody new for that short period potentially, um, but also not losing that long that um, employee who's out over the long term. So I don't have those to hand, but I'll send the commission something, uh, a few things on that point. And a second question for you, James, is it, it, I mean, it'd be helpful for me to see if there's a there's a there's a graph that would say what wage replacement would be, and it would be higher at the lower income, and then at some point it kind of flattens out. Is, is that a, is, do I have a correct understanding of how that would work? At some wage mm -hmm. level, there would it, you wouldn't go above it. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so the, um, yeah, and I, I can send, I have a graph of that that wasn't in the slide. I can send that along to, to folks as well. But you, you got it right that the, the lowest wage employees are going to get 90% of their wages back. Most folks are going to get, you know, somewhere between that 90 and about, um, you know, 90 and two thirds. And then there are some folks who are going to get less than that who are at the very high wage at the spec end of the wage spectrum because the, the replacement wage is capped. So like I said, do that chart. Great. And finally, Dusty, I, I really appreciate your principles and, and you incorporate this in almost every principle that you did. But one of the things I really appreciated and would almost call it out as a principle is that the value of simplicity in administration. Um, I, I think that really needs to raise up to a principle because um, we all know programs that have really gone under because they've been too complicated to administer. So um, again, but I appreciate the principles as you laid them out, that was great. Thanks. I thank you for, for that question. And I will say as a policy subcommittee, and I, I, I wanna flag that included myself and James, um, staff from um, the Employment Law uh, Association, Maine Equal Justice and um, MPA, as well as the whole coalition chipping in we actually grappled with the, um, the UI standard, not because it isn't an excellent standard, but because it's a little more confusing. It like doesn't, it doesn't just automatically make sense to folks. Um, and you heard me stumble over that slide and I understand the content, right? Um, we ultimately decided that because it already exists, it is the simple approach, but, um, that the principle of simplicity was absolutely at the front of, of our conversations. Thank you so much, Dusty. I have Wendy and then Commissioner Fortman. Thank you. Just building on that question and, and even your response, um, I'm sure many employees are very familiar with the UI standard, but having said that, I'm sure that many are not. There are states that have put in a, an even simpler formula up front to say, you know, 90% of income replacement up to a cap of X, whether it was $1,000 or $1,200, which is even simpler than dividing their weekly wage and, and, um, and applying a two-part formula. Is there a reason from a from a cost or math perspective that you didn't go down that path? I mean, I can say that it does get more expensive fairly quickly, especially if you're as high as a 90% wage replacement rate. Um, the advantage of kind of splitting it in half like that is you can offer the 90% rate to the lowest income workers. Um, you know, if you were trying to keep the cost the same and spreading it out over the same amount, you'd be looking at something more like um, two thirds, which, you know, if you, if you had two thirds for everyone up to the cap, that's going to mean that the low income workers are really disadvantaged. So in theory, you yeah. could do something that was like 90% up to the cap. It would just be significantly more expensive. More expensive. And um, what did you consider the lowest wage earners? So the, the example uh, that SD walked through was a person making 750, so 39,000 a year. Um, ballpark, what were you considering those lowest wage earners and where would the 90% come into play? Um, so the 90% is um, envisaged as being up to half the average weekly wage. So that's um, everyone earning up to, it changes every year, but it's roughly okay. about four, $450 a week. You get 90% back. Um, okay. so. Thank you. 
Thank you. Up next, I have Commissioner Fortman and then Emily. So oh, thank you. And um, and I also really appreciate the simple, trying to keep things as simple as possible. And I would say that unemployment insurance is not is not a model I would use as simple. Um, so so uh, I think some of the questions that Wendy asked um, are ones that I also echo. It's like. Uh, I, I think early on when people were looking at paid leave, there was an interest in tying it somehow to unemployment insurance. And especially in some of the newer models that has been separated. Um, and um, so I was also curious about that. And, and because the, um, this is an individual benefit you would not be doing anything around experience rating. It would just be a, a, a straight um, contribution, um, the, the same amount for uh, that everyone was contributing, not based on any other uh, experience, correct? And I see James shaking his head and so does Desti. Okay. Yeah, Great. that's right, yeah. Thank you. Anything else to follow up on that, Dusty or James, or I'll set on that? Um, up next, I have Emily followed by Drew Christopher. Thanks. Um, so I was just curious um, if there was any consideration given to 100% wage replacement for low wage earners and what that would look like. Um, you know, I understand wanting to keep it simple, but also like if we are essentially creating a new agency, then it seems like we also have the flexibility to, to create a new simple program rather than just adopting one that already exists. Yeah, I, mean, I can say something from like the math point of view, there's no reason you couldn't have 100% wage replacement for the lowest income workers. Um, yeah, I, I think sometimes the consideration has been whether has been not wanting to, or a fear that that might encourage folks to take leave, I guess. I don't share those worries necessarily as much as some folks have traditionally. I don't think, I think that, that with the eligibility, there would be, yeah, there would be eligibility requirements. And I don't see people taking leave when they're not qualified to or just because they want to. So um, I think that's something you could certainly explore. And I would agree that um, you know, certainly for our coalition, we really want to center the needs of the folks who most need the system. Um, I would be very happy to entertain 100%. Um, I echo what James said that I think in many states that um, the, the something other than the full wage replacement has been what has tempered that the fears of when you offer something like a 20 to 26 week benefit, um, do people fill up that time? And, um, you know, reminded of the um, gentleman from Colorado who gave maybe the best quote ever in the history of a commission hearing, the juice is not worth the squeeze. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only person who wrote that down um, and plans to use it forever. Uh, but I think that that's part of what's countered that fear. I, I absolutely think though that the commission has an opportunity to explore ways that we build equity through our public administration of systems like this and that 100% replacement for the folks at the lowest end of the earning spectrum um, might be a way that you move toward equity. Thank you. I have Drew Christopher followed by Sarah. Um, yeah, I'm, thank you for uh, raising that because I also, um, Emily, cause I, I think also we should be starting the conversation where it needs needs to be. When it comes to low wage workers, that's actually really what is going to get people. So thanks for raising that. Um, my question was specifically about um, the family definition, and I'm I don't I'm not familiar with those. Um, uh, with those definitions and, and wondering uh, if it makes sense, like when we were looking at paid 
sick time. Um, I know we were going sort of with the federal definition of family, which is, is this like related by blood or affinity? Um, so any one with a close association that is family-like um, and just want to make sure that we're aiming things broad as that. Curious if the, um, the statutes that you raised um, are that broad. I think that the statutes that I raised would need also to be supported by another piece, which would be that blood or affinity or, um, you know, familial like bonds. Um, so I did not share that in writing and I will um, certainly do so um, immediately. Uh, and then you can have a look, um, but I, I agree that it, it does need to be, and I thank you for raising it, that it needs to be connected to existing statutes and then add other language to ensure that it includes all kinds of families. Um, just to follow up on that, like I do, the, the definition that we pulled around that when we were working on paid, uh, paid sick time, um, I think actually is the federal government's definition. Broad, that would be rather than pulling from state and then having to add stuff for the sake of somebody going back to something that the federal government has been using for a long time might work. Andrew Christopher, I just want to say we I think we get most of your question, but if your internet does get spotty and you do want to ask something, just you can also type it in and I can read it out loud if that um, if your internet goes down. Um, so just let us know on that. Um, up next, um, I have Sarah. Um, so I have a question around some of the data that um, that you talked about from other states. Specifically, I'm wondering if the data that you saw from um, usage in other states got to the level of detail around um, of the folks that used paid leave, how many um, used all or almost all of their available entitlements. And also um, within that, if you got to the level of detail or granularity around were people using, big consecutive chunks of time or were they, for example, using, you know, 12 weeks, but intermittently did, did the data that you reviewed um, give you the ability to sort of review questions like that? Um, e, uh, mostly on the first part of that question, I think most of the states have information on that. So they, they depending on the on which program it is, they break it down a little differently, but um they as far as i remember from the reports and i can send the commission the reports and the highlights from those um they show kind of what um which kind of use people are taking leave people are taking so whether it's family leave or medical leave or for their own health um uh, the average the average number of weeks that people are taking um and um but i don't know how uh, i think they have some statistics on the number of leave takers and the number of leaves taken which would give you a sense of whether people are just doing it in one chunk or intermittently um, but I'm less certain about that. So um, I'll forward you the reports that I have um, on those, but they definitely have some of that information in there for you. Uh, just um, in terms of sort of a, a gut check, this is an assumption on my part, mm -hmm. but you can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm assuming that the data does not show that, for example, in a state that offers 12 weeks, the vast majority of folks took 12 weeks. Right, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, and especially sort of the higher up you go, because the you know, once you get to 20 weeks, you have even fewer people who have a, a need for the full 20 weeks. So as far as we can tell, it seems like mostly people are taking what they need um, rather than what's available. So. Do you have a follow up, Sarah? I'm all set. Thank you. So I'm sorry. I'll take my hand down. Sorry about that. I was just make, taking notes at the same time, so I wanted to make sure I didn't miss it. Any other questions? Yes, can you hear me now? Yep, I can this hear you. Bonita. Okay. Um, I have a question related to excluding the small businesses. Can you speak a little to that? Because Maine is made up of so many small businesses. And excluding them, I'd like to just hear a little bit about that and if you have some experience with that. Um, I, mean, I can speak to it a little bit from, from the math um, side. Um, yeah, I mean, the thought was that um, this would be, um, as Desi said, sort of, um, if there's an, a shared employee and employer contribution, that the smallest businesses don't have to pay the employer side contribution, um, their employees would still be paying in. Um, it does not, it, it doesn't add the biggest amount of the cost, it is sort of 
eight, an extra cost effectively because you're reducing the amount of revenue that is subject to the payroll tax. Um, partly that's because although there are small, a, a good number of small businesses, as you know, in Maine, um, by their very nature, they don't employ a huge, that many people. Um, so, you know, most Mainers, even though there are lots of small businesses, most Mainers still work for big, for larger businesses. If that makes sense. You know, it doesn't take doesn't take many companies employing a, a thousand workers to offset um, a large number of people. You know, only employing large number of businesses only employing five or ten workers. Um, so I can certainly make sure you all have the math on that. Um, but yeah, that's that's one reason why um, it doesn't have the biggest effect on the total cost for folks. I just looked at our um, kind of the internal calculations, and of course, it doesn't include the, the backup math. But I think we're looking at um, an addition of 0 0.03 uh, in order to exempt those folks. Um, so, and that that's um, you know, from James's modeling. So it's a it's a really small additional amount for what can feel like a a big relief for a lot of employers in Maine. I do just want to, uh, Bonita, um, we can resend this out on the better balance framework um, comparison between the states. It did show the other states that have um, different small business exemptions and what those cutoffs are. We can also, um, I know we have speakers who will be coming later on this morning, um, you know, who can sort of maybe drill down into what that has looked like in other states, maybe not, you know, at the level of the math that James and, and Dusty were just mentioning, but we can also get some more information on that as well for commission members too. Thank you. Of course, and I do really wanna quickly read, uh, Drew Christopher did wanna put in um, their comment, uh, but before the internet got garbled, so I'll just read it real quick. So um, in short, the federal government uses the following, and I'd love to see something this that is this broad. They say, um, an individual related by blood or affinity to the employee whose close association with the employee is the equivalent of a family relationship, have been ta having taken care of and supported through death someone who was a dear friend and didn't have a local partner or family of origin, I want to make sure that relationships like that are respected. So thank you, Drew Christopher. I just want to make sure for those who are watching and don't have access to the chat that that was added to the record. And then real quick, we're coming right up on time. Um, I did have a couple of questions really quickly. I'm wondering, James, in your modeling, um, did you account for you know staff and infrastructure costs? And um, if so, what was that based on and what was that allocation looking like? Oh, you're on mute. Oh, it had to be someone that was on mute. Um, yeah, I, um, I did that, those costs that I laid out there did not include um, uh, the startup costs. The, I think the, the, D, the main DOL has, has had a few estimates from prior bills on what startup costs might be. Um, I think one of the most recent ones is that sort of setting up a system could cost Sort of a one-time cost of about $35 million. I think there could be ways that we might be able to reduce that um, from that baseline estimate. Other states have had some pretty good success in um, thinking innovatively about how to set up systems. Um, and then there's a relatively small um, kind of ongoing cost for staffing as well of, um, I don't remember the amount off the top of my head, um, but I think it's in the range of like three to five million a year um, for staffing. So um, you would ultimately want to add that on as well, um, but I'm sure um, DOL and the Office of uh, Fiscal and Program Review would help estimate that as well. Thank you, James. Just to clarify, the ongoing costs that you're mentioning that you're estimating were not included in the premium calculation? That was not, no. So if you were adding, you know, if you had a, a, a if you had a policy where the basic cost was 150 million and you had another 5 million for administrative costs, that's sort of probably the scale that you're looking at. Thank you. Any other questions for the commission? Going once, going twice. Well, we're right up on our time. So I do want to thank Dusty and James and the coalition for taking the time to present. Um, if anyone does have any follow-up questions. Oh, Representative Stearns. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I, I just don't want my silence uh, in any way to give folks the indication that I don't have a great deal of trepidation about many of these figures that are not, not total. Uh, I worry a little bit about the California piece with no increase uh, of cost. I want cost defined before I buy that. Um, I worry about the 50% to 90% cliff 
which uh, those type of cliffs uh, usually end up in people trying to manipulate uh, their lives in order to stay just under the cliff, uh, 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 those kinds of problems. And I also worry about uh, uh, if I were to operate a small business and I have four people making widgets and uh, the federal government comes up with a, a federal plan and Maine uh, goes far above and beyond the benefits of the federal plan. Why on earth, unless I'm my widgets are lobsters or something unique to Maine, why on earth would I take my five person organization and, and go to another state where um, I don't have that hanging over my head as a small business? So I, I didn't want my, my silence to, to think that, oh boy, this sounds like a great cup of tea. However, I'm, I'm still interested in learning more about it. Thank you, Representative. Um, I can just add very quickly on the on the cliff question because I do think that's a valid one. The way it's envisaged is that it isn't a cliff necessarily. It's it's similar to the way that sort of uh, income taxes work, but there's a marginal replacement rate. So every dollar you earn over the threshold, you get replaced at fifty percent, but you still get that ninety percent replaced for the first chunk. Um, so it would be smoothed out. It would not be necessarily a cliff for folks. Thank you for that clarification. And that's definitely something we're gonna to need to get more information on too. And is one of the things uh, that I think will be uh, crucial in the actuarial study to know the financial realities of what that would look like. Um, Emily? Yeah, thanks. Um, I just feel as, a, as the small business representative, I feel um, compelled to respond to Representative Stern's question regarding um, small businesses and why they wouldn't move from one state to another get if a federal plan was put in place and was less expensive. Um, I think small businesses by their nature are rooted in community. And um, you know, our our whole like effort is generally based on a community of people that have supported our um, our our roots all the way up to where we are now. So I don't think it's realistic to say that a small business would move to another state simply because there was a premium that was $5 more a week in Maine. I think that's a pretty far-fetched scenario. Um, and I think small businesses tend to care about their workers uh, on a on a on almost a familial level. So you know, having our workers have the best access to the best benefits possible is actually something small businesses are interested in and not something we would shy away from for, you know, what amounts to a small dollar amount contribution. Thank you, Emily. I'll, I'll just add in, I mean, I know this is the difficulty of the task that's in front of us. I think we all agree we have somewhere we want to go. We might just not agree on the path. And I think it gets to the heart of why it's so important to get, you know, the actuarial study going and also why I think these conversations are so beneficial, you know, hearing from the different states who've taken this on and what it's looked like. Um, both, you know, the benefit and economic ramifications we've seen. Um, it's great to have places like, you know, Colorado or Massachusetts or even, you know, Rhode Island or Washington to be able to sort of see what that's like. I mean, one of the things that I, I love being able to say as Maine goes and we get to be a leader on these things, but this is one of those great policy points where we get to sort of look and explore and see the ramifications that's gone through and hopefully, um, hopefully you can all see one of the great things about all these different presentations is hopefully enabling us to avoid some of the pitfalls that other folks have gone through and also really learn a lot of the really great bonuses and benefits that um, we can find from other folks because policy is best done in collaboration and not in a vacuum. So I wanna thank uh, Emily for adding that in. Very important, thank you Representative Stearns and I wanna thank our presenters as well. Um, we are starting to run on legislative time. We are 10 minutes behind when we told our next presenter we'd start. So I do wanna say uh, thank you to Dusty and James again. Um, we can follow up with any questions as well. Thank you for your time this morning. And I do wanna kick it over. Um, we do have a presentation from both our local main chamber as well as the US Chamber of Commerce. I will let them introduce themselves further, but we do have Peter Gore um, from the Maine State Chamber as well as Mark Friedman um, presenting from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, who I also believe does have a uh, main connection, having worked for you know a 
former Maine uh, policymaker as well. So with that, I will kick it over to Peter and Mark. Good morning, Senator Daughtry, and good morning, good morning, members of the commission. Um, my, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Peter Gore. Um, I am the executive vice president of the Maine State Chamber of Commerce. I've been with the state chamber for about 28 years, and I've spent my entire professional career working in the area of uh, the work, workplace, uh, labor laws, workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, and the issue of family medical leave has been one that um, I've been involved with for quite some time. As a matter of fact, um, back in 2004, I sat down with uh, then Senate President Beth Edmonds, uh, David Brenneman with Unum, <coughs> to crack craft what was at the time the only, only law like it in the country, which allowed people to take um, and use their vacation or sick time to take care of a family member, even if it was outside the FMLA law. Um, even today, even though I think that the times have left that law behind us, I'm quite proud of having been part of that. Um, and I think it also is reflective of the position of the chamber and many in the business community that paid family medical leave is inevitable um, in this country and perhaps in the state. Um, I have testified on a variety of FMLA proposals in the past, paid FMLA proposals, and I've worked with Senator Daughtry on hers. hers. And as I have said each time, um, what's important is to get the information, gather the information, um, design the program that you think will best work for this state, um, and then figure out how much it's going to cost through an actuary, um, and then what the implications are for the workplace. Because in doing this, you are creating a new entitlement program that people will pay into, and the expectation is they will use it. So what's the impact on the workplace when you do that? Um, there are some things to keep in mind, and you know some of this, but it bears some repeating, and I'm going to say a few of these things before I hand it off to Mark. Um, in Maine law, our state FMLA statute begins with employers with, a, uh, with 15 or more employees. That's vastly different from what most of the rest of the country uses. They either tie their, if they have a state law, if they, it may be less than, less than the state law of 50, it may be 25, but at 15, we have one of the lowest thresholds in the country for FMLA law. I've got somebody checking on this figure, but roughly 80% of our employees in the state work for a small business with 20 or fewer employees. Um, that's a huge number. And, and it's somewhat different from what you just heard in the previous, uh, by the previous presenter. It's also important to note that most of these small businesses do not have an HR department. Um, and that means that what happens in the workplace with regard to leave, the administration of the existing FMLA leave and, and the future administrative burden that's associated doesn't fall to somebody else in the com company. It falls to the person who runs the company, um, the business owner themselves. Um, and as we all know, in the very challenging economic environment we operate today, um, that's tough enough as it is. Um, existing FMLA is not without its issues in the workplace. Before I did this presentation today, I reached out to a number of employment uh, uh, law attorneys, folks who work with businesses to say, what does FMLA present as a problem? And um, there are issues in the workplace regarding FMLA, um, around issues of performance, job retaliation, accusation of job retaliation, the ability to get one's job back. Um, that does happen. But by, by far the largest problem in the workplace with regard to FMLA um, is in the use of intermittent leave and how it impacts the workplace. Keeping track of it, disputes over it, um, et cetera, et cetera. Intermittent leave is a, definitely a, an issue. Um, things to consider as you go forward. I think it's already been discussed what your definition of serious health condition is going to be. Um, and who is a covered family member? You just heard a presentation of a very broad definition. Others would like a very narrow definition. Over the years, Maine and the Maine legislature has um, their definition. Um, they've expanded it when it's necessary to meet the challenging uh, or the changes in the dynamics of the workplace and in the family. Um, but they haven't allowed it to get too broad. Um, we think there's a, there's a sort of sweet spot in between. I'm not sure I can tell you what that is. But whatever that is, it has to be taken into account on the financial end of it. In other words, the broader the spectrum of people become eligible 
for leave, the more likely that it is that people will actually take the leave and that impacts costs. There is something that's important to remember, and I'm gonna say this one more thing before I hand it off to Mark. I mean, it was touched on a little bit previously, but um, in a time of a critical workforce shortage in which almost every employer in the state is operating. I mean, I heard it yesterday, I hear it almost every day. Um, and th those shortages are in every sector of our economy. <clears throat> employees are out on leave, whether it's paid or unpaid, um, there is, it doesn't, it impacts, or as I guess what I would say, the business of the business doesn't change. If you are making a widget, if you are delivering a service, if you have a product that you need to get out, that doesn't stop. If you have contracts that need to be fulfilled, whatever that is, that doesn't change when people are out of it, out of, out of work, whether they're on, whether they can't hire somebody or whether they can't whether someone goes out on um, a paid FMLA leave or unpaid FMLA leave. In other words, the work has to be, has to continue. And in the environment we're operating right now, there already aren't enough people in the workplace to fulfill, you know, in many cases, um, the workflow that is required. That means a couple of things have to happen. Either the work doesn't get done or the work has to be transferred into the existing employees that are in the workplace. And that's important to remember because in all these discussions, I'm not sure that's been discussed. When people are out of work, somebody else has to stop, step up and fill that. That means it's either more overtime or there's more work for that person. And that impacts how, what their work, home, family, life situation is. Um, and that creates its own set of problems in the workplace. So those, I haven't heard that discussed anywhere. I hear it from employers. I think it's important to put on the table before you go forward. And, and, and again, in the, in the totality of what you're trying to do and the programs that you're in the program you're talking, these are all important discussions to have. So with that, I, I asked my friend Mark Friedman to um, do a presentation on what's happening nationally from the perspective of the business community in the chamber. Um, I feel very honored to have been able to work with Mark. Um, he is the Vice President of Workplace Policy in the Employment Policy Division at the U.S. Chamber. Um, believe it or not, in the U.S. Chamber, Maine is one of the, it's the only state chamber that is represented um, on a couple of the major policy uh, committees that they have. And I was lucky enough to be chosen as that person. And so I got to work and know Mark. Um, he's been a wonderful um, resource and asset to me and to the chamber. Um, before joining the chamber um, in October, Mark was the regulatory counsel before the Senate Small Business Committee chaired by both uh, Senator Kit Bond and our own Olympia Snow. Um, he does have some Maine roots. He does have um, some understanding of what goes on here in Maine. Um, I think you'll find his presentation interesting and eye-opening, and I wanna hand it off to Mark, and then I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Mark? Thank you very much, Peter. Good morning, members of the commission, Senator Daughtry. Thank you for giving me a few moments here to just talk about what we've been seeing in the, in the question of paid family leave in the other states. Um, Peter actually hit on several of the points I was going to make, but I think I'll make them to sort of associate myself with those remarks anyways, as we used to say in the Senate. Um, <clears throat> to begin with, I want to just make clear Peter invited me to, to spend some time with you, but I'm not here speaking on behalf of the main chamber. Um, we've had various conversations and we are in broad agreement, but he is his own person and I'm speaking for the U.S. Chamber. Um, at the U.S. Chamber, our position has evolved. Um, we were previously in the basically just say no mode, and I was often that person just saying no. Um, and now we are much more in the is there a way to say yes mode with regard to paid family leave. Um, as Peter mentioned, there is, a, I think, a sea change happening here. Um, and we are, in fact, being led by our members, particularly those who operate across the country and in multiple states who are looking for a simplified national um, style platform that they can use to avoid some of the patchwork effects that have been uh, developing out in the states. Uh, my purpose for coming to you, coming before you this morning, is to help you see some of the issues that we think you need to take into account um, and the, you know, hope the commission can move forward in a responsible way. As Peter noted, 
um, you know, there is a there are better and, and less good ways to do these types of programs. And we hope to to focus the commission's attention on some of the ways that seem to have made some sense and some of the issues that we think um, need to be addressed. <clears throat> um, I guess I'll, I'll just sort of start with by saying the question of desirability of leave is not on the table. We need to understand the need for leave. We're all people too. We all you know, have moments in our lives where we need leave and we understand the desirability of it as a benefit. And this is why you see employers uh, offering it as a benefit. Um, in general, we believe those who can do. Um, so that typically is some larger employers or <clears throat> employers with a certain amount of um, resources that can apply towards the question of providing paid leave. Um, the challenge is always, how do you create a universal benefit that is fiscally sound um, and respectful of employers' needs to have employees available and yet generous enough to help to, to be helpful to employees? Um, Peter has touched on some of those questions about having employees available. Um, Representative Stearns mentioned the fiscal issues earlier. These are very important questions that the commission needs to find solid, defensible answers to before they can recommend an overall approach. Um, and as Peter has highlighted, in general, we see small businesses as having the biggest problems with a paid family leave benefit. Um, you know, if they don't have the same revenue or resources that they can apply to this, to this question, um, as we've just discussed, the absence of employees can be highly disruptive. Um, and, you know, also they don't have the internal um, structure, the, the HR department, the, the experts to, to work on these questions. And uh, no matter how much the, the commission or the state um, tries to address all these questions, there will be more questions in terms of implementation. And it can tie up a business uh, into knots trying to figure out what the right approach is to stay on the correct side of the, of the law. Um, <clears throat> we do note that uh, partly as a result of the pandemic and partly as a result of other things, um, the landscape has shifted on this question. As I noted, we're no longer in the just say no mode. Um, part of the pandemic, I think, exposed the need for leave. Um, there was a federal paid leave benefit for a certain period of time underwritten by a refundable tax credit. And I know this may sound shocking, the earth kept spinning on its axis. Um, this came and, and, and things didn't end. Um, and I should note the chamber did not oppose that benefit. We were silent on that debate. Um, federal employees now have a fully paid family leave benefit that was enacted during and supported by a Republican administration. Um, and now we do have a legitimate bipartisan conversation going on on the federal level about providing some form of paid leave benefit around family needs, albeit the R's and the, and the Republicans and the Democrats are not really speaking the same language yet, but both camps are putting forward proposals. So that's, that's movement, that's some level of progress. Um, <clears throat> getting down to where employers have, have had problems uh, with the current FMLA system on the federal level, and also by extension into some of the state questions. Um, <clears throat> fundamentally, and, and I think um, Representative Stearns sort of put his finger on this, there are no free lunches. Um, this is a expensive uh, benefit and it needs to be considered um, in, in that light. Um, even if the benefit is administered in, in what I usually compare it to as a, as a UI style program. And, and here I wanna be clear, I'm not linking the two benefits together as, as was mentioned in the previous discussion, but just the UI model is used here where um, there's, a, there's money collected and then employees have a triggering event from which they can draw benefits. Um, even if it's handled at the state level like that, you still have problems within the individual employers. As I mentioned, um, you have administration costs on the employer side, just figuring out what you have to do and keeping um, people uh, processing their claims. Um, and as we mentioned, again, um, taking people out of the workplace requires a, a shuffling of workloads in some ways, either more overtime or other people have to step up and, and work longer hours. Um, as we've said, the work you know, doesn't go away. It still happens, especially if you wanna remain in business. I should also mention, and this is this is somewhat awkward, but um, there is a potential for misuse. Um, we have seen it even in the unpaid FMLA world, 
And certainly if you start talking about a paid benefit, um, we could expect this to happen. And, and here it's a very challenging question because um, employees talk to each other and, and you know, they'll say, hey, you know, I was out on my FMLA leave, ha, 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 went deer hunting or some other such use of the leave that wasn't appropriate. Um, and then that leaves the other employees in, in an awkward position where they feel like someone's taking advantage of the system and they're not. And sometimes they'll go to the employer and say, hey, you know, I just heard this. And the employer is really hamstrung. At that point, they really don't have a good answer because unless they want to challenge an employee and call them out, they can't really come down on them for misusing the leave. And, and there's a really awkward morale question there. People think that people are taking advantage of the system um, and, and there isn't much recourse. I'll be clear, these are exceptions, but they do happen. And I think we could anticipate them happening uh, in the context of a paid leave benefit. Um, there are also the questions of, as I mentioned, fiscal solidarity. Um, once you institute an entitlement, as, as Peter identified this, it's everlasting. And that means you're probably going to find yourself needing more revenue over time, means more taxes on somebody. Um, even though I understand that you're considering this in the context of employee contributions right now, the potential exists for those contributions to include employers. Uh, and once again, we talk about the small businesses here as being uh, the most um, significantly impacted. Um, I'll also mention that once you create this entitlement, there is a real expectation that the uses for it will be expanded. Um, you know, we had an interesting conversation about the definition of a family. And let me just be clear. I understand that the notion of family is, is something of an elastic term, maybe evolving. What employers need here is clarity, is some sense of limits and definitions so that they don't have to guess whether someone's really got a true familial relationship. Um, and, and the more the commission and the state can give employers clarity on that term, the better off I think everyone will be. We'll all know who's, who's eligible and, and who is not. But back to the question of expansions, um, you can expand in various ways in terms of who's eligible, what events trigger benefits, um, lots of other little details that can be added on down the road, which all add up to more cost, more complications for employers. Uh, and so when we look at this at the, at the outset, um, a lot of us are also looking at what this is going to look like down the road and what the possible um, other complications that may arise from it will be. Um, let me just finish on this note. Um, <clears throat> I want to reiterate, these are not reasons for not pursuing a paid family leave benefit. Um, these are just issues that we think the commission would be advised to acknowledge um, and that to the extent that you can put forward recommendations uh, that address these, I think the, the process will be better served. I believe you should have in front of you. If you don't, I will make sure you do uh, a document that I submitted to the commission um, through their staff that identifies various provisions uh, that are typically included in paid leave programs taken from other states. This is language that we reviewed that we think does the best job of addressing some of these questions and that um, we hope you, know, you might consider as, as model language for your purposes. Um, and let me, let me just, uh, one other point I just want to finish on because we've had a little bit of discussion about it already, and that is a small business question. Um, although it's not included in the recommended language document I, I just mentioned, we do believe that there needs to be some consideration given to small businesses. Um, as Peter mentioned, you have an FMLA exemption at 15 employees. There has to be a recognition that small businesses um, need to be looked at in a different light than, than other employers of larger size. Um, with that, I will um, conclude my remarks and I am happy to engage in the dialogue with members of the commission. Thank you for letting me be before you this morning. Thank you, Mr. Friedman. And real quick before we jump into questions, just something while you're speaking, a question that I couldn't remember if we had gotten from a prior speaker, so I'm sorry to, to jump around, but I just wanted to check in with Colleen. Did we ever hear back from Connecticut um, they were going to get us more info on the program and the family connections and the um, language that they're using. This is pretty broad in their system. If we hadn't, I'm just wondering if we can just ping Connecticut again to be able to get some of that. 
I just pinged them again yesterday um, to ask for their follow-up, but we have not yet. So um, I will uh, attempt to do that again. Um, I just emailed um, the attachment again from Mark Friedman, um, and I'm going to drop it into the chat as well for you. Thank you so much. Um, and then moving right back to questions, uh, Barbara. Hi. Uh, thanks to both Peter and Mark. Um, I guess the one thing I want this commission to do is to make their decisions based on data. So the question I would have for both of you is, goes back to the same question I asked of James, which is if you're going to bring forward the costs of having a worker absent, we need to see some data about that. We, I, you know, I, we need to see some information that helps us understand what we know about that. And the second caution I would give Mark is um, to be a little careful about using anecdotes. I have no doubt that any, any policy we might put in place has the opportunity for some misuse, but I really don't want us operating on having the minority um, of people drive the benefit from most. So unless we think that's an overwhelming big issue, I would be careful about having anecdotes drive our, our policy decisions. Thanks. Fair, fair, fair enough. And, and let me just respond to that briefly. Um, what I was bringing that forward in is in terms of problems that employers have seen. Um, I, I understand that you're not going to try and drive a big, broad policy measure by isolated anecdotes. But when employers consider these types of programs, these are the issues they've encountered. Uh, and so I just wanted to bring them forward in that light. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, they are the minority, they are the exceptions, but they do create issues um, in terms of what happens on the ground. Well, let me, and let, I, me let me just follow okay. with one thing, Mark and, and Peter, which is, so I think you heard at the beginning that I'm a pediatrician, I'm not a labor law person, but to sum up what you're talking about the employer's face, if we had... Um, a program that was administered by a third party that would support them. Does that mitigate some of those concerns? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure how, what kind of a third party you're talking yeah. about. Can you give me a better idea? Um, well, I'll say that I'm not entirely sure either. But for example, we've had an, uh, <laughs> a request from Unum, from, from Unum to be the third party. So rather than I mean, it could be an agency within the state or it could be a, an agency that the state contracts with that could. I, I, I know in my own in my own health system, we use an outside third party for our for our, um, our UI work, uh, partly to take the burden off of our HR department. And we're pretty big. Hey, hey, hey. Sorry for jumping in there. Um, yeah, I think the third party model has some great advantages, and I would hope that um, as this process moves forward, that opportunity, that, that um, option is, is maintained. I don't think it quite addresses the question of employee misuse because employees, regardless of who's administering the benefits, may be able to use them in, in a way not intended. Um, I think the third party model is a, is a good model to explore. I don't think it quite answers the question of when employees are, are using benefits inappropriately. Yeah, yeah. I guess I would say this: um, uh, the third-party model is is an, is an interesting one, um, and you know, that, and and this speaks. But unless you want to empower that third party into being the arbiter of whether someone's using their benefits correctly or not, which I don't think they're going to want to do, and I think the law would prohibit you from asking some of these questions. I'm not sure it changes that. As someone who has done, you know. FMLA, workers' comp, and unemployment insurance, and, and represents the business community, and has heard anecdotes. Nobody likes to bring those up, to be honest with you. I mean, nobody likes to talk about those. It's very difficult because you, you are, you know, by implication, painting everybody with a broad brush, and that's not the case. Um, it really isn't the case. It, 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 it doesn't mitigate the fact that businesses he, this happens to employers, um, and it may not happen frequently, but it's those stories um, that, you know, get businesses concerned about where we're headed 
um, on any of those issues anytime you talk about change. Um, and I'm not, and I completely disagree with you. I completely agree with you. Those things shouldn't drive the overall policy decision. But we also just can't um, ignore those. We don't feel you can just ignore those either. But they shouldn't be the overarching driver of the policy. Okay. Um, I have Sarah, then Emily, but Wendy, I know she put a comment in the chat. I don't know if you want to respond to that real quick or if you have something separate. Did you want me to respond, Senator Daughtry? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind just uh, sharing what. Oh. Sure. I was just um, adding that, you know, given that we do operate in a number of states where we have state paid leave, Dr. Crowley is right that our employees, um, it really does not add a significant um, impact to the company for administration um, in states where uh, the process is that an employee just either calls the state and, and we also have um, third party administrators who do that as well. So um, even though we have a well-developed system in terms of HR, um, there's minimal burden. Thank you for adding that, Wendy. And then Sarah and Emily, and I'm gonna turn off my video real quick because our puppy has discovered the Christmas tree holder has water and is throwing a drink at it. So I will put <laughs> Senator Daughtry. Um, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Peter, for um, spending some of your time with us today. I appreciate that very much. Um, Peter, I, uh, my question's for you. I heard you in your comments a few moments ago, you were you were voicing a concern um, both on the part uh, uh, representing the business community, small employers, and also individuals who are, you know, having to pick up the slack when somebody's out. Um, it seemed like you were really concerned about the implications of, you know, there's work to be done and now folks won't be here to do it because they're out on leave. Um, and I'm wondering if you could um, talk, um, talk a little bit more about that because from my perspective, um, it made me a little bit confused because I would think having a paid leave program would make it more likely that an employee dealing with something, you know, in their personal life would be able to, for example, take three weeks, deal with it and come back. If I, you know, if I was that person's colleague, I would want them coming back. I wouldn't want them quitting. You know, if I was a business owner, I, you know, employing a company with 20 people, I would want that one person who needs to address something very significant in their, in their life to be able to take the time they need to address that and then come back and not have to deal with the, you know, the, um, the costs incurred of having to replace that person. So could you talk a little bit more about that concern you were voicing? Sure. I, I don't necessarily disagree with you. I mean, I think, um, you know, you work with folks, you want them to come back to work when they have something going on. I mean, you do. Um, but whether someone's out for, you know, three weeks or they're out for 10 weeks, say the full state, you know, law um, that's currently allowed, that doesn't in those three weeks or in those 10 weeks, that doesn't mean that the, whatever it is that that business is doing, whatever widget or project or service that business is, is engaged in stops. Um, and particularly if you're under a contract deadline or something like that, and that, you know, you have absences, which are exacerbated by current workforce shortages, it just makes it harder for the other employees. I'm not saying they don't want them back, but it doesn't, it also doesn't mean the work of the company just stops, or you can say, well, geez, we're going to be down a few people. So we're not going to meet our contract deadline. It doesn't work that way. Um, and so the issue becomes that work has to continue and other people in the company it, um, have to, uh, you know, have to pick up the slack. You know, it would be different perhaps if we didn't have the workforce situation we have now, where there were plenty of people that you could go out and hire on a temporary basis to bring in to salt to fill that person's job to get that widget out the door. But the situation is exacerbated by the workforce shortage that we currently have. And whether that's a permanent thing or not, no one really knows right now. Um, so I, I can, again, and again, I'm, I want to say I'm conscious of Dr. Crowley's um, admonition, but I will say that I have heard from other employers who have said to me, look, you know, we work it out um, and we get, we, we get whatever widget, you know, we have out the door, our product completed. But there's some resentment by those employer employees who are there having to do the job, not all the time, but sometime, because it's more work for them. And it takes away from their work life situation as well. If they have to put in an extra 10, 15 hours a week in overtime, that's time that they don't have with their families, too. So 
my only point in all that was to bring that forward so folks can think about it. You're right. You know, people need time. You know, again, as Mark said, the inevitability of paid FMLA leave was certainly um, uh, highlighted by the pandemic. But it's a multi-systemic issue. And it's all I wanted to do is that hadn't been discussed before this commission, before today. And I wanted to put that on the table in front of you. Hey, can I just add on to that for just a, a brief point? Um, you know, the more predictable an event is, the, the more employers can plan for it and make arrangements. New babies are, for the most part, predictable. Um, and so if you have an employee who needs you know, to take off because they're having a new baby, either the father or the mother, um, you can plan for that. You have some lead time. The things that really, I think, give employers the biggest headaches are the unscheduled leaves. Again, we're not saying they're not legitimate, but they occur, and those are the ones that really create the disruptions and harder to, to accommodate and, and plan for. Um, and, and, you know, again, and as we've said all along, this is not a reason for not doing it, but people need to understand what employers hear when you say, oh, we're going to create this great new lead benefit, and they're saying, wow, you know, what's that going to do to my operations? Um, and they're not being selfish. They're just trying to be realistic here. And, and I, I, you know, the more the commission and the, and the state goes forward, their eyes open, the better you can anticipate these reactions and, and acknowledge that they are legitimate and find solutions. You have a follow-up, Sarah? Or? All set. I just have to say, what I keep hearing is that Representative Stearns is going to have to start a widget business. I think that seems to be one of <laughs> that we're getting at. Could um, it be a wicked widget business? Oh, there we go. Go right next to Wicked Whoopies. Um, up next, I have Emily, then Wendy, then Representative Stearns. Wicked, good, wicked, wicked, good widgets. Wicked, good widgets. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think. I'd like to echo, you know, some of the things that have been said already, but um, something that Mark just mentioned that really kind of struck me was, you know, when there's a sudden event and employers can't plan for it, um, that's when, when it gets more complicated. And as an employer, that's true, um, but those events are going to happen whether we have paid leave or not. So someone's going to have a stroke, their, their family member's going to have a heart attack, whatever that the case might be. And my preference would be to have my employees be supported in that and uh, be able to return to their job when that event has been appropriately dealt with um, and have, have that benefit. Um, I also see that tied to the current labor shortage. Um, I'm in the construction industry, which is an extremely uh, short staffed industry at the moment in Maine. And it's also one, a sector that is quite busy and growing. Um, so we're wrestling with that every day, but we find that uh, we are able to keep and retain good workers, um, reliable workers by offering benefits, uh, whether it's pay um, or, you know, we opted to implement the paid leave plan that was um, adopted in Maine recently, although our business is not required to. And honestly, haven't even felt that. Um, so I think once these programs are developed and implemented, employers get used to them, and they're also a tool for attracting and retaining high quality staff, which is extremely important in a tight labor market. Um, so, you know, the, the unexpected events that occur um, are going to happen regardless of, you know, whether or not we have a paid leave program. And my my extreme preference would be that my employees are able to access benefits to ensure their return. I also think it's, I don't think this has been touched on at all, but I think it's important to mention that the discrepancy in the workplace that has been um, exacerbated by the pandemic between men and women in the workplace is, you know, something that really 
is directly related to paid family medical leave. So if women are sort of forced into leaving the workforce um, in order to care for family needs, and I say that, you know, it could be a woman or, or a man or, you know, any individual forced into that position, but I think broadly speaking, the majority of that generally falls to women. And it's been proven through the pandemic that women are leaving the workforce for that very reason. And that only exacerbates the the situation of having um, a limited workforce. So I think, you know, if we can support people to be able to take care of their personal lives as an employer, I'm all for that. And I'm all for contributing to that because honestly, you as an employer, you know, things change, the amount of money you pay for things changes over time. And it's something you adapt and adjust to, and it's completely possible and doable. Oh, and one other thing I just like to highlight too is, um, I, you know, the the having a plan that is administered by the state um, would completely alleviate any kind of HR concerns I would have around this, and I think my small business colleagues would have around this, um, especially. Um, I had never kind of needed to interact with unemployment insurance until like the very beginning of the pandemic and, um, you know, hadn't had experience with that um, for a short period of time and worked well. It did the job it needed to do, and it really didn't create any additional burden to my business. You know, I'll, I'll just say this about the administrative burden. Um, and I, I don't really think it matters whether it's the state who administers this or a, a, an independent third party. There, there's a perception, I think, that if either one of those things take place and the administrative burden is off of the employers um, through this system, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, employers are going to have records that they are going to need to keep. They are going to need to track when people take leave and particularly intermittent leave. Um, if someone's taking leave in, in 20 and 30 minute increments, which happens today, I might add, um, you're just not going to pick up the phone and call the state or some four, third party to tell them, oh, I, as a business, you're going to have to keep track of that. And then you're going to have to end up reporting to whatever administrative entity there is that's going to then pay this person for the time that they have. So this administrative burden is not just simply going to go away for small businesses because the state or a third party takes it over. It's there. It will continue. It will continue because the legal counsel for these businesses are going to tell them to do it. Am I not wrong there, Mark? Um, so it, the administration and the administration administrative burden associated with this program. And again, let's be clear. Neither I nor Mark are sitting here saying you shouldn't we're just saying, if you're going to do this, you need to recognize the multi-systemic elements of what it is that you put together for a plan. Right, and, and you know, Peter's right. There will be outside counsel and inside counsel that advise these companies to make sure that they're taking care of their, <clears throat> doing what's necessary with respect to record keeping and, and other burdens. Um, and I fully hear you, life happens. That's just the nature of us, our existence. And we're people do need leave. And this is part of the reason why Peter and I are sitting here saying there's a there's a, a change here. We, we, we see this coming, but the goal is to make sure that you take into account as many of these issues as possible as you as you move forward. Um, you know, as, as Peter has said, burdens don't go away. They, they're going to be there as much as you try to mitigate them. They're still there. And particularly you know, maybe your company is run in certain ways that other companies are not, but a lot of small businesses, particularly those who have not put in place a leave program yet, are going to look at this and say, oh, no, you know, this is going to be a big, big shift in how they operate. Um, and maybe part of our message today is, as you do this, you need to get people ready for it and do some real outreach and education to get people familiar with it. So, Assuming this comes online at some point down the road, you know, the shock is, an, is somewhat softened and people can, can understand how to work with it. 
Um, if I was a business owner and I hadn't been doing leave yet and somebody said from on high, thou shalt do leave now, I'm going to have a big vertical learning curve right there and it's going to be a shock to my system. Thank you. Apologies, I'm wrestling through my new uh, desk over here. Um, I have Wendy followed by Representative Stearns. Thank you. Um, Sarah, I would, uh, and, and Emily, I would really echo your comments over the past few minutes. Um, I would also respond to the question of administrative burdens by saying that when you run a business, whether it's large or small, there are a lot of administrative requirements and I'm sure even small businesses are uh, required and, and are paying attention on a daily basis to all kinds of administrative issues. I'm not sure that this adds a significant administrative burden to companies who are already tracking hours for the purposes of knowing who is at work any given day who and paying those folks. Um, with over 30 years of experience, I can tell you that we have not seen a significant amount of abuse of any kind of leave. And we offer very, very generous leave programs at my company. When we have added the, uh, the states where we offer state paid leave, we have not seen an increase in the number of employees taking leave in those states in spite of the fact that there is a paid leave benefit. Um, as, as Emily said, the requirements or personal needs for leave happen. And we know that they happen regardless of the size of the company. And they happen at a moment's notice or with months of planning. Um, and, and those are just challenges that employers face. So the way we have tended to look at all of our leave programs is that they've really offered us the benefit of being able to recruit and keep employees um, and we have a very broad multi-generational workforce. And we've often described our leave programs as being really important to people along the whole career spectrum for so many different reasons. Younger employees in their 20s often taking family leave to start families. Um, older employees often taking uh, personal leaves for their medical situations or for family medical situations or elder care leaves. So, you know, we have seen it as an incredible tool for being an employer of choice where, and we are always happy to welcome our employers back. And I would just say over the years, we have seen very, very little abuse. Um, but when you offer any kind of a program or you have hundreds or thousands of employees, you certainly will have a handful who abuse any situation. And in my experience, you know, we talk about the fact that, you know, if you see it and you don't have a way to address it in the moment, that behavior will repeat and it will catch up with that employee over time. So, you know, certainly a leave program that we design would have appropriate requirements for documentation, et cetera. But um, I, I just don't see the administrative burden or the risk of employees abusing this as um, a significant issue. Thank you, Wendy. So to summarize, could I, could I say one of your points is karma is karma? <laughs> Sorry, not to make light, but. <laughs> It catches up with people, Senator Daughtry. <laughs> um, and thank you very much for sharing your experience, especially with an employer the size of L.L. Bean. Um, with that, I don't know, Mark or Peter, if you have anything to add there. If not, right over to Representative Stearns. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, once again, uh, uh, Mr. Gore, in his remarks, uh, captured a, a few of the things that I were uh, that I was going to bring up. Um, you know, the widgets that I was involved in from an administrative level, I served ten years as a superintendent of schools. So my widgets uh, ran around and got off the yellow hound every morning and came into the building. And though, as far as I'm concerned, they're the most important widgets in the world. Uh, but a long term absence by someone and they occur. And uh, um, in the environment that I was an administrator, uh, the collective bargaining agreements covered a lot of these uh, different types of leaves. Um, but some things that, that are definite, and one is that uh, yeah, I know there are only a handful of folks that misuse that, but it, it takes a disproportionate amount of administrative time for that handful uh, in order to, uh, to keep the ship running. 
Um, for example, both in hourly and salaried personnel, I routinely, routinely had folks that used every moment of sick leave, personal leave, whatever was in their contract, and never had any available. I also routinely had folks that did a whole career, and literally we had a gentleman work 17 years and never took a sick day, despite medical calamity. So there, are, it's a broad spectrum, and uh, and the the business about other employees being put on the spot by folks who do uh, misuse leave is very real. I had situations too in just a 10 year period where people stole physicians pads and, and created medical uh, situations. Those are big deals. Those take a lot of time. And, and if, again, if you're a, a small outfit, you can't expect the state to figure that all out or some other agency. You're the, you're the head of the corporation, if you will, even if there's only three people in it and you've got to, you've got to deal with those matters. So with that said, again, I think uh, the message is if, as we go down this trail, let's build in those checks and balances as best we can to minimize the, those types of things and, and make the thing work as, as best we can. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Stearns. And uh, I definitely say those are some very important widgets as well. Um, before we you know, jump to our next presentation, we're coming up on time. I just sort of wanna say, you know, having listened to both presentations and also more importantly, all the information we've been receiving since the commission really got started off. I think one of, you know, our roles as commission members is to listen to all the information and sort of pull out the different bits that really apply to our state and, you know, the needs that we're trying to fill. And um, maybe this is just how I operate as an individual, as a policymaker. I always try to find the, the common threads between everything we're hearing. And I really find whether we're hearing from Washington, whether we're hearing from Connecticut, whether we're hearing from Better Balance, whether we're hearing from the coalition or whether we're hearing from you know, the US Chamber of Commerce, there are common threads. And the one thing, you know, the things I keep going back to are interestingly enough, if we think back some of the first phrases all of us commission members said without even having all of these presentations. And for me, you know, looking at my notes, the things, you know, the needs are the same for employees and employers. We need universality, accessibility, affordability, and most importantly, I think the top line message that it doesn't matter whether you are starting up your first small business, you know, like myself, or whether you are a, you know, top level executive in HR at IDEX, it's simplicity. You know, it doesn't matter whether you are looking to plan on having your child for the first time. As the employee, it needs to be something simple you can look at and something you can understand. As that employee's employer who's trying to plan with them for that you know, momentous occasion, it needs to be simplicity. If something, the worst happens, and like you're saying, you know, the intermittent leave or medical emergency, for everyone involved, for the employer you know, trying to figure out, you know, one, trying to line up coverage, and second, trying to figure out how to deal with that, we need to make sure you know, and we need to find a way and keep that goal. And I urge all of us to keep that at the front of our heads is that simplicity and accessibility, because it doesn't matter whether you're on the administration side, employee, employer, or, you know, on whomever is issuing what we're looking at here, it has to be something that people can navigate. Um, you know, Commissioner Fortman highlighted, I think, in the other uh, presentation about maybe, you know, issues with the existing programs such as UI and others. And I think that's a challenge we really need to think about in all of this. And I thank all the presenters today for sort of presenting that. And I have to say, as a employer, you know, this is something that we have been wanting to offer for a long time. And that ability to do that back end is something that keeps, you know, folks like my own business and other small ones from being able to take this on. And so I think this is really the universality that we have to think about is we can all agree we want to make sure that folks are taken care of, but how do we do it in a way that enables folks to access this? It enables it to be easy to use as well. So just sort of wanted to throw that out. Um, and that's you know, the note that I'm keeping and starting every page is sort of about the simplicity and accessibility as well. Uh, Mr. Friedman. Thank you. Um, let, let me build on your points and just add one other, and maybe this is embedded in your simplicity mantra, but I would give you that from the employer's perspective, 
what they value most is clarity. Um, and I think the biggest problems we have with the current FMLA world and, and maybe in some of the other um, state run programs are things that, that come in, that, that show up between, that show up in the gaps. So, you know, you have the advantage of starting from scratch and looking at what, what's worked, seeing where there have been problems and trying to build your program around addressing those issues and, and those problems. So we mentioned it before, serious health condition has always been a, an area of challenge and, and it, it begs for clarity. Um, the use of intermittent leave, while necessary, also begs for clarity. Um, you know, these are the things that have given employers the most headaches over the years. Um, and, you know, unscheduled intermittent leave can really create a headache. And, and to Representative Stern's um, history, I've heard various accounts in the um, school system world where people not showing up have caused a lot of problems. Um, so it, it, it does happen. The more you can think about these things and try and build in um, provisions that address them, the more clarity employers will have, the less challenges they may have in implementing this. And, you know, dare I say, the less they may be uh, exposed to lawsuits or, or outside legal, um, you know, efforts to try and get them to do things that they weren't prepared to do. So I'll leave you on that note, clarity, 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 right clarity above simplicity, or maybe simplicity slash clarity something like that, but that would be my, my mantra for you uh, in terms of designing a program that can be most easily adopted by employers. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Friedman. And I would agree that clarity is definitely linked in with simplicity. You know, if it doesn't matter, you know, as I said, where you are in this area, if it's not, you know, inherently clear how something is able to be used, we're all gonna be trying to navigate something as clear as mud if we don't have that you know, behind us. Okay, last question comment goes to Representative Stearns and then we do need to move on to our next presenter. Thank you for indulging me, uh, Senator. I just wanted to point out that uh, they, can, they can easily be, the, be this natural rift between employer and employee. And uh, uh, one, one way to look at this is uh, these checks and balances that I mentioned would be what's fair to employees. And I think if, it's, if, if you create rules that are, that are fair to all the employees, including those who don't take advantage of, of these leaves, you will have addressed many of the concerns of the employer. But uh, that's just a different lens to look at that. Mm -hmm. I would say fairness. I think that might have come up in one of our earlier conversations as well, which I think sort of gets into the universality as well. And I see I'm doing bad. I had another comment. Um, but with that, trying to keep us a little bit closer on um, our timeline, I do want to thank um, Peter Gore and Mark Friedman for joining us from the U.S. Chamber as well as the Maine State Chamber. Thank you for taking the time and for sending your materials as well. And just a reminder to everyone, if questions come up, I don't know if you're like me, if you're cooking dinner, you think of something you wish you'd mentioned, you know, several hours before with all of our presenters, please keep in mind that Colleen, Anna, and my co-chair and I are here to help facilitate and connect you with folks. And thank so, you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mr. Friedman, as well. So with that, we're moving on to our third presentation of the day. Real quick before we move in, does anyone need a uh, bathroom or stretch break? Okay, I think, we're, I think we're, we're die hard Zoom mode today. So good to hear. With that, I want to introduce Suzanne and it's Holton. Is that how you say your last name? Uh, it's Holtine, but close. From, <laughs> I will just kick it straight over to you to do your introduction. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here today. I was able to tune into kind of the last little bit of it, and it sounds like a very interesting conversation you all are having. Uh, so I am going to attempt to share my screen here and presentation. Let me know if it gives you any trouble. We can make sure you have the right permissions. Okay. Does that look good from your end? Not seeing it yet. Oh. Let me see. If Let's I try again. There we go. Now we're starting to see it. Okay. 
If we can just have you enter full screen on the slides, please. Is that working? Looks perfect. Take okay. it away. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Let me actually gonna move you guys over for a second. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you so much for having me uh, here today. For those of you who are not familiar with NCSL, we are the bipartisan membership and professional development organization for state legislators and legislative staff in all 50 states and territories. Um, providing testimonies such as uh, today is just one of the many ways we serve our members along with thorough and timely research on just about every policy issue under the sun. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here to talk to all of you about paid family and medical leave as it is a topic that we are seeing much more interest in um, across the states. Uh, I'm Suzanne Holtine. I'm an associate director in the Employment, Labor, and Retirement Program with NCSO. Uh, so there are a few things that I plan to on covering today, and I expect a portion of this or, or a good part of this uh, you are all well versed in, but perhaps it'll be a little bit of a refresher for some. Uh, I'll give a quick overview of paid leave then dive into what we've seen in terms of legislative action, especially this year. Then I'll go through a few state examples and then finally review all the policy considerations that need to be um, looked into uh, when thinking about a paid family and medical leave program. And then finally, I should have uh, plenty of time for some Q&A with all of you. So first off, let's just basics, uh, review the types of leave that exist. Uh, so employee leave benefits generally fall into one of these four categories, um, all of which can be paid or unpaid. Parental leave is commonly synonymous with maternity and paternity leave or time away from employment to care for and bond with a new child uh, around the time of childbirth or adopting or fostering a new child. Family care leave is time away from a job to care for a family member with a serious health condition. Medical leave is to attend to one's own um, serious health condition, such as um, an operation and then needing time for recovery. And then finally, sick leave is a short-term time away, uh, really just to recover from a less severe illness, such as uh, a cold or the flu, uh, this is typically for oneself or a family member. Um, because sick leave is, is short term and not considered part of the family and medical leave, uh, so I won't be going into that today. So essentially family and medical leave, again, is long-term leave to care for oneself or a family member, including a new child. Uh, paid family and medical leave in most states is anywhere from four to 12 weeks at a partial rate of pay. Uh, family and medical leave works in most states as an insurance program where both the employer and employee pay into the program. However, that does vary a little bit, and we'll dive into that momentarily. Access to paid family and medical leave is uh, not as prevalent in the U.S. as it is in some other countries. However, however it has been on a slow increase over the last 15 years. Um, and it's becoming much more accessible in state and local government jobs with a quarter offering it, but it's also rising slowly in the private sector. Support of paid family and medical leave is above 80% in the US, although there is a divide on whether this paid leave should be mandated or up to employers themselves to decide. Most agree that the lion's share should be paid for by the employer. Uh, this is becoming much more of a bipartisan issue with a majority of Democrats supporting paid leave and at least three quarters of polled Republicans and independents think that new mothers should have access to paid maternity leave and that workers should be able to take paid leave to deal with a serious health concern. So currently we are aware of 10 states and the District of Columbia that have paid family and medical leave. Oregon and Connecticut enacted legislation in 2019 and Colorado passed a ballot initiative for leave in 2020. Uh, Georgia enacted legislation this past year, which applies for paid parental leave up to, oh, sorry, um, 
uh, paid parental leave up to three weeks, and it took effect in July. Um, and this is just for state employees, and I'll talk a little bit more about Georgia in a moment. California was the first state to pass paid family leave in 2002. Currently, all but Connecticut, Oregon, and Colorado are being implemented. In most of these states, paid family and medical leave is available to all private sector employees, and it's roughly half that offer it to public employees, a few with the option for public employees to opt into the program. So I'm gonna dive into a couple of state examples. Uh, so the first one is New York. Uh, this legislation was enacted in 2016, but it did not become uh, effective until 2018. Uh, this, is a com this is common as it allows states time to start collecting the premiums. Uh, New York's leave is available to all private employees and public employees who employer opts in to the program. Um, it's also available to full-time domestic workers and those who are self-employed. Employees must meet a minimum work requirement before being eligible to take the paid leave. New York does separate medical leave with their family leave. So the temporary disability insurance covers medical leave and is only for oneself, whereas the family leave is to care for an ill family member or bonding with a new child. In New York, workers cover the full cost of paid leave. In other words, the premium payments into the insurance program come from worker wages and not the employer. Uh, the temporary disability insurance is split between the worker and employer. Uh, so both pay equally into that insurance. Employees receive partial wages for the time off, roughly two thirds pay for family leave and half pay for medical leave, uh, but payments do max out at $971 a week. Uh, New York did just increase the length of leave from 10 weeks to 12 weeks for family leave, and for medical leave, 26 weeks is allowed. Um, and so New York is pretty similar to most states with paid family leave, and that is mostly funded by the employees. Uh, the exceptions being the District of Columbia, which is currently funded only by the employer. Co uh, Connecticut, Colorado, Washington, and Massachusetts are jointly funded by the employer and employee with exemptions for smaller businesses. Um, and as mentioned earlier, states typically allow at least a year after enactment uh, for states to start collecting the premiums before the leave is available. Uh, one of the issues brought up by opponents of uh, paid leave is the solvency of the insurance programs. Uh, so in other words, if more workers take leave uh, than um, is projected in a given year, will the insurance fund be depleted? Um, in an analysis of some of the earlier programs in California, New Jersey, and Rhode Island have found no issues with solvency. And in most cases, the insurance funds have experienced surpluses. Um, as a result, in California, they've recently expanded who is eligible for paid leave, um, given the program's additional funds. Um, but obviously, it's an important question to ask for any new state looking at a paid leave program. So my next example is Georgia's new law, which was enacted this past year. Um, this example is a little different, but I thought it's important to kind of include the, the range and variances in states um, and where they're going with this. So the bipartisan paid parental leave legislation provides three weeks of paid leave for full-time state employees who are part of the executive, legislative, and judicial branches, um, and also boards of education. So this includes teachers and other employees in K-12 and higher ed institutions. Employees must meet a six-month work requirement in order to qualify for the benefit. Uh, the bill has already taken effect as of July 1. Uh, and one of the reasons they were able to implement this bill almost immediately is because it does not create any type of new funding mechanism or insurance pool. Uh, state employees who have worked full-time for six months are eligible for the benefit uh, once in every six, uh, 12 month period. And as far as we know, the employees do receive 100% of their pay during these three weeks. 
um, and it does not count against any accrued sick or vacation time. Uh, again, it's important to note that this is just for uh, parental leave and it's not gender specific on who takes the leave. Uh, so these are some of the bills that um, NCSL has been tracking, and these are all available um, on NCSL's early care and education legislative database under the topic uh, uh, prenatal infants and toddlers, and I'd be happy to um, share that link with you. Uh, this year, we are aware of at least 29 states that have introduced legislation with five states enacting bills. Uh, so I just mentioned the, the Georgia bill. Um, and obviously Maine had legislation to create this commission. Um, Hawaii similarly passed a house resolution to create a task force to study paid family leave in the state. Um, Oregon's passed a bill, um, as I mentioned, Oregon uh, did um, enact legislation for paid family and medical leave, uh, but they did have a bill this year that delays the implementation of their paid family and medical leave program. Uh, specifically, employers will begin making contributions to the state's paid family and medical leave insurance on January 1st, 2023, which is a full year later than originally anticipated. Um, employees can begin collecting benefits on September 1st um, of 2023, which is eight months after the initial timeline. Uh, New Hampshire included in their budget bill this past year a voluntary paid family and medical leave program for up to six weeks paid leave at 60% pay. Um, and we have not included this in some of our other tracking simply because this is a voluntary program. Um, and then finally, Rhode Island has made some adjustments to their program, uh, which I'll touch on shortly. Uh, you know, we have seen um, some trends. It's It's this definitely is a growing topic of interest, especially in the wake of the pandemic. Uh, in 2019 and 2020, roughly 24 to 25 states introduced legislation. Uh, so there's been a slight uptick this year, this past year. Uh, and last year, as we all know, the Federal Families First Coronavirus Act, or, or FERCA, gave an unprecedented number of Americans access to paid leave that they didn't have prior. Um, so this, and this did include the tax incentives for businesses, which have since expired. Uh, although we at NCSL don't try to predict the future, uh, we think it's very possible that in 2022, we'll see more states examine the possibility of paid family and medical leave. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, some early adopters of paid leave have gone back to make changes to existing plans. Um, and most of these expand the access and time for leave. So California expanded leave from six weeks to eight weeks, and they've also expanded who can take leave to cover uh, leave related to military active duty or call of a family member. Uh, New Jersey increased their wage replacement from two thirds salary to 85% of salary and also increase the duration of leave from six weeks to 12 weeks. Uh, New York expanded leave to include instances of domestic abuse, assault, and stalking, as well as paid time for bereavement. Oregon, as I um, mentioned, they, they did push back their implementation. Um, they also passed a, had a bill to provide tax credits to small businesses who provide um, uh, some sick leave. Uh, Rhode Island increased their paid leave amount to five weeks or will in um, 2022, and then they will increase it again in um, 2023 to six weeks. Um, and again, one of the main reasons we are seeing this expansion of benefits is because states have discovered their insurance funds are much more solvent than, um, than they expected, which allows them to provide longer and more coverage for time off. So now that you've heard a little bit about the activity, um, I think it's important to think about um, what needs to be considered in any paid leave policy. And obviously for these, it's, it's not a simple yes or no question. Uh, so we're gonna dive into some of these considerations. Um, and it, this may not be an exhaustive list, of course, but um, first off, the, the type of leave. Would this include things like parental leave, family care leave, 
medical leave or a combination of types of leaves? Uh, what are the qualifying events? Bonding for a new child, such as birth, adoption, or foster care, care for a family member with a serious health condition, care for one's own serious health condition. Um, how does military duty count, if at all? Um, qualifying extingency arises out of a spouse, child, or parent being on active duty. Um, so would that be included? Does serving as an organ or bone marrow donor count as leave? Uh, certain purposes arising out of employee or employee's minor, um, or as, as we saw in one of the other examples, a child or dependent experiencing domestic violence, harassment, sexual assault, or stalking. Would those be considered qualifying events? And then who's the eligible worker? Is it all workers? Is it state employees only? Private sector employees only? Independent contractors? Self-employed individuals? Um, what about gig workers? Are those included? And then what's the definition of family members? And over time, we see more broad definitions of family members. And in some of these early adopter states, um, updating who qualifies as a family member has been common. So this could include child, spouse, domestic partner, parent or parent of a spouse or domestic partner, grandparent or grandparents, spouse or domestic partner, uh, grandchild or grandchild, spouse or domestic partner, sibling or siblings, spouse or domestic partner, individual related by blood or affinity whose close association with the employee is the equivalent of a family relationship. And then the funding mechanism. So who's paying for the policy? Is it employees only? Is it employers only? Um, or is it some combination of both? Of, or is there something else? And then administrative mechanisms. Um, is this through the state's temporary disability insurance? So an example would be Rhode Island. Um, uh, or is this a separate paid family leave program? So in the instance of Oregon, they've been standing up something new or something else like a private insurance company, which Vermont explored in legislation this past year. And then the wage replacement, how much can the employees taking leave receive? And is it based on the average weekly wage in your state? Do employees receive a full replacement or a partial replacement? Or maybe is it a tiered, um, tiered reimbursement based on the income? And is there a maximum amount an employee can receive? And then the duration of leave, perhaps four, 12 or more weeks of paid leave. Uh, does the amount of time you can take depend on what the reason is for the leave as is in different amounts if it's bonding with a baby versus your own medical situation or caring for a family member? And must it be taken all at once or can it be periodically over a set period of time? And then finally, what if any exceptions um, or waivers might be allowed? Um, so as an example, are all businesses subject to this requirement or does staff size matter? Um, and who and for what reasons can employee opt in or opt out? And what's the criteria for participating in the benefit policy? So again, none of these are a simple yes or no question. It's, it's really, there are a number of variables to consider when looking at a paid family and medical leave program. Um, and there's also a need to balance what opponents and proponents of leave policies have to say. Those in favor see mandatory paid leave policies as a significant opportunity to improve the health and well-being of children. Um, and these policies can help safeguard family income and keep work workers connected to jobs. And obviously opponents are concerned about placing additional mandates on businesses that can be burdensome, burdensome requiring all workers to contribute to a plan many may not take advantage of, as well as over overstepping government's role. And of course, the costs associated with guaranteeing a paid family leave benefit. And so that is my presentation. I will close this out and um, am available for any questions. Thank you so much. Um, let's just end the screen share real quick so we can see everybody. Do we have any questions for Suzanne? I do real quick. Um, you mentioned Hawaii is also looking at a, a task force kind of similar to the commission that we're doing here. I'm wondering, 
how many states have sort of taken that that course or are considering currently in statute taking that course? Um, you know, I do not know, but I'd be happy to go back and look into that. Um, I, I think a couple of states have been have been examining it first with the commission um, or task force and, and then reporting back to the legislature. But I, I'd be happy to get kind of an exact number on that for you. Yeah, totally out of curiosity. I'm just, you know, it's interesting to see which states are sort of taking which processes. So thank you. And I apologize. I'm getting pelted with tennis balls. Uh, Commissioner Fortman. <laughs> Thank you. First of all, I want to just say how much I really appreciated um, this presentation and in particular the variables to consider because you did a wonderful job of laying out everything that we need to be looking at. Um, you also said that there are no easy yes or no answers to each of these. I, I, was, I was wondering if there is a like double click that we could do on each of these. Have you done an analysis of um, not necessarily the pros and cons, but the benefits of each of these or, or anything that, that looks at each of these issues in a little bit further depth. We have not done that. Uh, you know, I, I believe in the past you've heard from A Better Balance and they do a really good job of kind of laying out the graphic that does a really job, good job of kind of laying out a bunch of these variables and how the states have where the states are going with those. Um, but we have not we have not looked kind of at the the benefits of of any of these variables. Thank you. I have a question from Barbara. Hi Suzanne, thank you. Um, you reiterated and we've heard before that every state that has adopted a paid family and medical leave um, who have changed it have expanded their benefits. Do you know if there's any that shrunk their benefits or shrunk the program? I am not aware of any that have, that have shrunk it. I think Oregon is the example from this past year of just uh, postponing their implementation. And, and obviously that was partly due to COVID and just concerns with businesses having to uh, pay into that premium. Um, but other than that, no, we have not seen, I'm not aware of any states kind of shrinking the program. And this may be a question that we should send back to the, our uh, Chamber of Commerce people, but the other question I would have is, if we know of any um, movement of employers out of states where they have adopted paid family and medical leave, if we've, and that, that may not be you as much as we, I may refer that back to our chamber um, folks. So thanks. Yes, they'd probably be better at answering that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Do I have any other questions? My colleague who's tuning in did just uh, let me know that New Mexico did create a bill uh, or had a bill last year to include um, a task force to help implement their paid family medical leave program. So I'd be happy to share some information on, on New Mexico as well. That would be great. I think it's just trying to find the universality or a commonality between, um, you know, there's the variables that you excellently, uh, excellent, yeah excellently laid out in your presentation, but um, it's sort of helpful to see how the other states, what they're bringing in their charges and duties who are taking sort of, instead of having a sample piece of legislation to start with, where we're coming from of looking at everything, it's kind of nice to sort of see that universality between everything. So um, any of that would be super helpful. Any other questions? I do apologize. I always feel bad for the speakers who come right before lunchtime. So you're definitely getting us a little bit more quiet, but- um, Totally get it. <laughs> thank you for sharing your presentation. I think it's particularly helpful after, you know, morning presentations to remind us to come back to sort of the different aspects we need to consider. So thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here. I appreciate it. Of course. And just as a reminder to anyone watching, as well as commission members. Um, the materials from NCSL will be on our website as well as have already been distributed. Colleen did send you the, slide, uh, the slides in your email so you can find them there as well. And with that, thank you so much Suzanne for everything. So we just have a few more things left on our agenda um, and keeping in mind the time. So uh, first off, we have two major things, well, we have quite a few major things, but the things on our agenda are first off to review the survey questions. 
And then most importantly is to consider public comment. That is one of our key charges. And it's something that my co-chair and I have been discussing doing at our next meeting. So um, to sort of lay it out, let's maybe perhaps start with the review of the survey questions. And as a reminder, um, for the commission members and for those who are tuning in, this is us just trying to find another way to enable Mainers to be able to participate in the process and you know, share their you know, anecdotes. I know we're after a lot of statistics for the actuarial study, but this is our chance to sort of collect sort of that other data and involve folks. Um, Sarah? So I have a question uh, around the intent of the survey. I know in, in our last meeting, we were talking about how it might be a mechanism that's more accessible to some folks who might not be able to join for a public comment. Would the idea be to get the survey questions confirmed at, in the next 29 minutes um, and, and then <laughs> make sure that that is made available to the public so that the results can be part of next week's discussion? So my biggest goal and my co-chairs as well is when the survey is made available, we want it to be for a longer period of time. So it's more than just one day where you can zoom in as well as over two weekend periods. So it's not just a Monday to Friday so that you have one weekend in there. So the goal would be to approve um, the questions today to be able to get that out. I don't know, looking at the calendar, if we'd be able to have that for the public comment period, but instead maybe see it as a public comment. Well, seeing it as a public comment itself to be able to review afterwards as we start considering making our next steps and recommendations for the actuarial study. So hopefully that answers your question. Yes, it does. It does. Um, with that, before we jump into reviewing them, any other questions or Colleen, do you wanna jump in on the review? Sure. I was able to share um, these with all of you in advance, um, emailed them out, but I'll just um, share them quickly. Um, I did put the um, revisions in red based on the comments from uh, the last meeting. Um, so I'll just quickly highlight where the changes were made. And then if anybody has any sort of global comments, we can talk about them, um, about how to, the mechanics of sort of distributing the survey and getting it out. Um, one of the members suggested adding as a component of the question related to race, um, uh, the ability to check off um, that they are a member of an indigenous community, recognizing the population in Maine. Um, we rephrased the question related to gender. Um, we added here um, just some clarification that when you're answering, um, someone is providing comments about their earnings from work that we're focusing on just earnings from work and not including any other income um, that they receive that's not from working such as alimony, child support, social security or other type of benefits or other monetary support. Um, when we're asking for some input related to um, the individual who fills out the survey as to their average weekly wage, we're asking for their take home pay. Um, recognizing that there might be, you know, different ways that people see that question, but we're just asking, you know, what's, what's the take home pay um, in their paycheck? And that might be the easiest way for them to answer that question. Um, new questions seven and eight are added related to try to get at um, household, um, how many members are there in someone's household, um, how many other members in their household um, that might be working. Um, number nine is a question related to whether or not someone currently has access to paid time off for family and medical leave. Um, number 10, this is trying to get at, I think Senator Daughtry raised this as a factor, um, is access to paid time off for family and medical leave something you considered or would consider when deciding to accept a job or where to live. Um, number 11 is a question trying to get at um, as an employee, how much someone might be willing to contribute from their wages to provide funding to support a paid family and medical leave program. Um, we noted here the ranges of wages um, and contributions from employees from other state programs uh, that range from as low as 0.10% uh, to 1.3% of wages. And so we just tried to provide some factors um, including 
uh, not willing to contribute as an employee and then sort of contributing up to those amounts. We can certainly adjust those based on, if you're interested, based on some of the input you got earlier about the um, specific proposal that the coalition is making. And then these questions related to whether or not um, someone has dealt with specific life events that might qualify for paid family and medical leave. We added um, sort of the concept of um, safe leave time for someone who's experienced family violence or a close family member has experienced uh, family violence. So questions now 12 and 13 add that as uh, a factor and then also added to this question about um, if you've had a life event, how did you handle it? Um, and adding as a potential answer to that question um, that someone left their job or stopped looking for work to address the life event. Um, the other potential answers really focused on uh, being able to maintain, uh, keep working. Um, and then uh, again, just clarifying and adding the element of taking leave for, fam uh, for someone who's experiencing family violence. And then at the end, we've clarified the question about how much time off someone needed to address a life event or would need over the course of a 12 month period. And instead of sort of asking for um, various levels of leave, we sort of just left that as an open-ended question for someone to fill in, as opposed to giving them the options underneath. Also asking, adding a question related to um, the amount of wage replacement that someone needed or would need if they took family and medical leave. And that ranges from full wage replacement to 50% of wages. And again, we can alter these factors based on some of the input if you'd like. And then these last two questions um, were some of the employer questions you talked about. Um, most of the other questions are, really, are directed towards uh, an employee, but we've added here a question about if someone is filling out the survey, if they are an employer, and if they are an employer, what's the size of their business? And then you also talked about really trying to provide um, a comment box or a text box at the end where folks could um, provide any additional comments. And I think this was getting at sort of the idea of using the survey as a mechanism to try to enhance um, the public comment that you might receive at a specific meeting, um, but provide easier options for folks as opposed to having to write out a specific piece of testimony uh, using the survey as an element to add that public comment. Thank you so much, Colleen. Just real quick, um, two quick revisions I was thinking of. Um, on the, I know we've had trouble about the portion you'd be willing to contribute. Could we add a portion that just says unsure, but willing to contribute? Because I think that might also be a factor. I mean, I know that's sure. kind of what my brain is right now. So figure adding that in. Definitely, Sarah. Um, I uh, thank you. So I don't, I don't necessarily want to think we should spend a ton of time revisiting this, but I was struck with um, that the last couple of questions about are you an employer? I'm not sure what we're going to get from you know. So if the person filling out the survey goes through all of the questions that are really designed for an employee's perspective, and then at the very end says I'm an employer, like what are I'm not sure we're going to get a lot of value out of that. So I sort of feel like we should either create an employer survey and offer that as its own thing or take those questions out. That's just what, that's how I, it landed with me when I saw that. I would say it definitely would be game for doing two. I think one concern I do have is we do want to make sure we're getting everyone involved and it is very easy to have. And yes, there's a clear definition between someone who'd be offering the benefits versus someone who'd be receiving the benefits. The other thing that I really struggled with is in Maine, we have a lot of folks who are working two to three jobs. So someone might be technically an employer in one and an employee in the other. So it's, I, I would say yes, but also still unsure if that, if that helps. So I'd be curious to hear what the other commissioner members feel as well. So, and, and definitely that was the point. Thank you for reminding me, Sarah. If on those questions, we need to make sure like you don't have to necessarily answer them because like we know from like 
survey monkey if someone says they're not an employer they shouldn't have to click a button that says how many employees they have so that would be my other concern there uh representative stearns and then emily uh thank you senator i have the <clears throat> excuse me the same uh same concern that that sarah brought up and i brought it up last time that it's pretty difficult to uh, combine those two yeah. survey uh pieces and that seemed like uh Kind of an add-on at the end, kind of a kind of a curveball, um, if you will. My other concern, though, uh, so so I would hope that perhaps we find a way, and I don't know the mechanism, uh, uh, but to hear from employers about their concerns. I think we've we've heard from the chamber group, which is important, but to hear from grassroots uh, small small main employers, I think would be an important consideration if we can do it. Um, the other one that I'm concerned a little bit about is the take home pay as opposed to what their gross income is. And because that's a wide, wide variable. Uh, we had, uh, um, again, working in the school system, um, small, a small lens that I look through. Uh, we had folks that literally took almost all of their wages in some type of uh, benefit. They used them to purchase insurance uh, and Maybe the the other partner in the household is making uh, really good money, but in order to not have to pay high insurance fees, uh, one of the partners went to work uh, in a, in a fairly low paying job with a decent benefit <laughs> that they had to purchase, if if you will. Um, other people might be socking money away into uh, different uh, financial savings kinds of things. So often. I, I, just, I think to be standard, uh, it would be better to look at gross pay and make our assumptions from there. But. I wonder if this can look at both, because I think the concern of wanting to drill it out is because for issuing the benefits, we'll need to know, or, or just trying to gauge people's weekly take home pay. But you're right, there are there are huge differences between gross and weekly. That That's one of those hard things to sort of pull out. And I am wondering, um, especially with Sarah and Representative Stearns with your comments, not wanting to create more work for ourselves, um, but if there is a way to maybe separate them out into two different surveys. I don't want to create more work for you, Colleen, but I'm thinking maybe, you know, having two might be the way to go. And then this is, I was remiss in um, uh, asking the chamber this, but I, I assure you that the chairs and my, uh, the two, my, my co-chair and myself will be following up with the chamber to um, solicit their help and making sure that we get um, their members notified as well as other business groups throughout the state. And I just wanna, you know, for anyone watching, we'll get into this after we finish with the survey about public common, really trying to make sure we solicit a large amount of folks, especially those employers you're talking about, Representative Stearns, as well as other voices as well. Um, Emily and then Drew Christopher. Um, yeah, so my kind of comments are related also to just the employer versus employee section. And if we are going to separate them out, it would be good to know, to hear from employers like, um, would you like to offer a paid leave program for your employees, but you're not able to, or how much would you be willing to contribute? Um, those kinds of questions would be valuable to get from employers too. And I'm not sure how the survey will be distributed, but maybe you just click like, click this link if you're an employee, click this link if you're an employer and you could fill out both surveys if you're both or something like that. I'm not sure. I think that definitely makes sense. And I was seeing a lot of nodding around the Hollywood squares while you were saying those questions, Emily. So. I think we're at a point where we can agree that maybe we need to separate this out. I'm sorry to create more work, Colleen, <laughs> so sorry. But I'd say if I can real quick and then Drew Christopher, I'll, I'll switch it over to you. The universality is, are you an employer? Do you currently offer this? Is this something you'd like to offer? How many employees do you have? Um, I would love to see one, like sort of like we said, fill in more information. I'd love to hear what have been the barriers if you don't offer this or what can what would be the onus like help you get over that hurdle to being able to offer this. Um, and I, I think that those would be where I'd start as the base state. So it'd be really love to hear any other questions we could throw in there to try to get as much of that out as we can for Colleen. So there's less work for Colleen after this meeting on that. Uh, maybe just, oh, was, can, can we maybe just add to that, um, like the contribution question to what employers would be willing to contribute? <clears throat> yeah, no, that would be key. 
Uh, Drew Christopher. Um, yeah, so I actually um, had a conversation with some of our members last week and a number of people um, are sort of low, like low income, self-employed people who are house cleaners, uh, massage therapists, um, that kind of thing over, over a variety of industries who had questions about how this might apply to them. Um, and we're really excited to know that a lot of states do include an opt-in for self-employed people. Um, and I realized that there's nothing about that on the survey. So I think maybe, I actually think those folks probably more belong on the worker side of the, of the survey if we're gonna split it out into two. And then a question about um, would they be like, would they be interested in, in opting in? And I think would be really good. Literally just got at the heart that I was unable to verbalize when I was doing the like <laughs> multiple roles and incomes. Um, I, I think that's right. So I'm wondering, um, would folks think it makes sense on the employee one to include a box that says, are you self-employed? Just yes or no. And then honestly, I think it would also make sense maybe even on the employer one, you would assume the person filling out the employer one would be the person who's self-employed and the employer, but it might be worth just putting the box on the employer one as well. Because someone could go through and say, I'm an employer, I have a staff of one. So you get what I mean? Okay, I'm getting, th I'm getting thumbs up. <laughs> Any other um, information we'd wanna solicit from that? Do you have a crystal ball or magic wand and can you fill it into the survey and send it to us? No, just kidding. Uh, Representative Stearns. No, I, I think that you have laid out several of the general questions and, and I have every confidence that if Colleen goes down through the existing employee survey and just looks at that through the lens of the employer that it will it will almost almost self create with her a little bit of magic but the idea that we're reaching out is the uh, is the important piece i think sorry squeaky toy um i i absolutely agree and echo those sentiments commissioner portman uh, if we don't want to go down this rabbit hole, I'm fine. The only other tweak on the employee piece is that on the contribution, I'm not sure if people will do the math. And so I, I, I just don't know if we could do that math for someone so that you had dollar amounts in there. Um, so on the proposal that we that we saw earlier, they had a range of 550 to 750. I, I don't know if there are dollar amounts. And if anybody has that information, Colleen, from some of the other states, um, I, I just think it's easier to know, am I willing to contribute $5 a week uh, rather than point whatever percent, but. I mean, we could certainly use, you know, I think it was Mark's demographic presentation about Maine's average weekly wage being about $1,005. You know, we could use that as the guide point and then sort of build off from there what the amounts would be, if that makes sense. Or if you wanted to pick a thousand just for purposes of the math, we could certainly do that. Um, and then um, build in the ranges that might make, it might make it easier. I think you're right, Commissioner, that people, I mean, I think that's what I was kind of trying to get at about saying unsure. Um, and I think it, people would resonate more with an amount rather than a percentage. Like my, my friend, my best friend's in New York and she's currently on their program and she was able to tell me exactly the dollar amount that it would co it cost her to be able to be on maternity leave and not the you know 0.02% that it is in reality. Um, the only other thought I had just now is maybe on both, we want to ask what county do you live in in Maine? I don't know if this is a rabbit hole I'm opening up, but just something to think about or not. I'm not seeing, I'm seeing a lot of blank expressions, so maybe you can throw that one in the rubbish bin. Sarah? I was going to ask what, um, if you added the county question, what would you do with the answers? Just kind of curious, because if we're using Google Forms, it'll auto-populate, it'll show you a graph. So I, I think my data head is probably getting out ahead of what we necessarily relate, but yeah. <laughs> Representative Stearns. M Maddie, I don't mind the uh, uh, county question as long as spelling doesn't count. 
Don't worry, that's where we use a multiple choice one. <laughs> I like the idea of the county question. It was interesting to see from the presentation about how many people in District 2 versus District 1 supported paid family medical leave. I think that was a helpful, a helpful statistic. And also I was kind of curious, like if on self-employed, if we're seeing a large amount of, you know, like multi-income or self-employed people from, you know, X county and not at other county. I, I'm just kind of curious. It, it's, you know, I'm okay, now I'm seeing head nodding. So sorry, Colleen, another question. Okay, anything else? And we can try to get this out as soon as possible because I think our biggest goal is to get it on the internet because I think that's one of the things that I'm most passionate about with the legislative process is accessibility and being able to have it up and making sure you know, that people can access it, which does get me to my other challenge. Once this is live, you know, we've talked about different associations and businesses being able to access it. I do want to challenge all the commission members that it's also up to us to put this out through our different channels. So legislators, I'm looking at all of you, be able to put this out, you know, through your offices to make sure we're getting a large amount of responses, you know, individuals, you know, folks attached to businesses, if you wouldn't mind, you know, putting it through, you know, if you have a newsletter, social media posts, you're at the coffee shop, you're waiting too long in line at the grocery store and you're talking to Bob, we haven't seen in a while, like all resources, please mention this survey so that we can get this out and get a lot of information. Okay, I think anything, last call on the survey, going once, going twice. And on to the next portion, still building off of, you know, our desire to solicit public um, comments. So the next meeting we have scheduled is for December 14th. I apologize, last meeting I kept saying December 15th, I was looking at the wrong calendar. And one of our biggest charges is to solicit public comment. So before, you know, we make the recommendations of what we'd like to see from the actuarial study, and as I mentioned just, you know, before we're running into a little bit of a rough spot of what time we were able to start based on when the legislature adjourned. So we are still trying to get permission to figure out if we can have another meeting in um, January, which we're still waiting to hear back on, um, just to let people know for planning purposes. We will not be making people meet over the holidays. There's something a little twisted about making commission about family time, meet during family time. So I just wanted to put everyone's minds at ease on that. Um, but we would, uh, my co-chair and I were talking about having the next meeting reserved for public comment. And so was wondering if everyone um, was amenable to that. Any thoughts, what we had sort of thought about the legislators on this commission will know this process kind of similar to a public hearing where we will just, um, we're gonna have enough time to be able to have people sign up, to be able to come and present before us. We'd ask people to, you know, keep in mind of how many people we have, you know, three to five minutes, be able to share their story. And we see this as anyone ranging from someone who has their own personal experience, like we've all shown, or employers or policy folks or practitioners, or, you know, we've had letters from UNAM and other insurance groups. You know, this is a chance for us to hear from you know, everyone who hasn't presented and really make sure that this is a community process. Um, and so that's what we're envisioning the 14th to be, but would love to hear if anyone has anything they'd like to see included or any questions or any ideas. Oh, everyone seems good there. So I will, legislators can back me up on this for folks who are not used to a public hearing, uh, just prepare, it can be a long day. It could potentially run over noon, depending on what, we have for people who sign up. Um, my co-chair and I, as well as our incredible OPLA analysts, will try to keep folks aware of how many people we have signed up to sort of get a better um, reality of what that day is gonna be. And also just as a reminder for folks, you know, if you have to pop in and out for different sections, um, the joy of meeting on Zoom is that all of it will be available on YouTube for us to go back and review. But I will say, you know, for that day, make sure you have a good glass of water, good cup of tea or coffee, make sure you keep stretching because it is the best part of our process, but also sometimes the longest. So um, with that, um, any other questions? You know, we're getting on you know, six minutes before noon, we might actually stand a chance of adjourning on time. I have a quick question, uh, just in terms of process. Um, so if someone wants to um, sign up to give public comment, how does that happen? How do people find this and find the link and know how to sign up? Excellent question. Thank you for reminding me. Colleen, can you sort of describe the brief process? And then also as a reminder to folks, all of this will be available on the commission website as well. 
Sure. Yeah. Um, so we're going to have to use a similar process to um, what was used during the legislative session, but because it's not an LD, there's not going to be sort of a, a, a set website. So what we're going to have to do is put a link on the commission's webpage where folks can uh, click on and register for the Zoom in advance. And we'll ask people to do that primarily um, to give us a sense of how many, um, but certainly people could um, and we'll ask them to do it in advance, you know, up to usually an hour in advance of the meeting so that then we can, right before the meeting, we can sort of generate a list the chairs can then have and see how many folks have, have um, registered for the Zoom. Um, and we will share that link um, also by email with our interested parties list for folks who have signed up. And then also it will be shared with commission members. So if you want to share it in addition or forward that link. Um, to register for the Zoom, um, that's how we're gonna, uh, that's how it will work. Um, and once folks register for the Zoom, they provide their email address um, and then Zoom will then provide them with um, the link for um, the meeting. Um, and it will be set up um, a little bit differently than how today's meeting was set up, whereas everybody came into the meeting um, with a, uh, uh, public hearing like this or public comment period like this, it will be set up like a webinar on Zoom. So we'll have panelists who will be the commission members. And then as um, individuals who have, who want to provide public comment, um, the chairs will have their names um, and identify who's, you know, slated to come in and staff uh, in our eye will sort of bring people over from uh, attendees to panelists. So then they'll be able to um, uh, be seen both by video and audio and provide their comment. And then after they comment, we'll move them back out of the Zoom to the um, attendee space. Any questions on that, Drew Christopher? Um, I, I did notice in the comment you're asking for the website URL, um, we can drop that in the chat and also if anyone is unable to find the link please let us know um, you can find it through the legislature's website um, and search for the commission and it has everything you need there and you can also reach out through opla to be able to connect be connected as well and also for commission members we'll make sure this is all emailed out to you as well and just like the challenge with sharing the survey please let you know, if you have someone in your life or you know someone who would be a great example or has a story to share or an idea, um, please, you know, make sure that they know that this is available and understand that this is all of our process and not just for those of us on the commission as well. So with that, I think my puppy has officially run out of squeaky toys and things to chew on. And I'm also seeing everyone else having Zoom face. So with that, I wanna thank you all for your really diligent work today. Um, I know that was a lot of information and I hope everyone has a great week. And with that, we'll join this meeting of the commission. Take care, everybody. Have a great day.